It's been a crazy week in mobile technology, and I'll be frank, I have no idea what's been happening. Between kayak expeditions, comparisons, reviews, and a never-ending flood of devices at our door, the podcast team has been overwhelmed this week, even more than usual. But not to worry, we've brought in the big guns to help us sort it all out. The news of the week, your listener mail, and a giveaway announcement all ahead on episode 094 of the Pocket Now Weekly, the once-a-week audio podcast where we discuss smartphones, tablets, wearables, and other gadgets you wished you had when you were a kid. From Boston, Massachusetts, I'm your host, Michael Fisher, editorial director at Pocket Now. Your first officer today will be North Carolinian senior editor Taylor Martin. Good day, sir. Hello! Hello! And joining us from San Francisco to help us sort through the chaotic tech landscape, a lady who needs no introduction, Miriam Joar, a.k.a. Tank Girl. Welcome to the weekly, Miriam. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So glad you're here. We talked about it yeah. just on the other side of the show, but I was listening to you on podcasts before the Pocket Now Weekly was a, a glimmer in my eye, before I was even on the team at Pocket Now, and before I was even a tech blogger. So, I'd like to think that I inspired you. You, you, you <laughs> most certainly played a big part in it, and I um, I realized that in other industries, what I just said would might make you feel old, but of course in tech, uh, everything oh. I just talked about was like, what, 18 months long or something? <laughs> like 12 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, it's wonderful to have you on the air. Um, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with Miriam, listeners, uh, you should be. But uh, she is currently with Pebble, but she is a veteran of Engadget and uh, maintains a blog at, is it just tankgirl.com, Mary? At tankgirl.com, yeah, absolutely, without the vowels. T-N-K-G-R-L. Yep, you got it. You know, it's funny you mentioned Engadget, of course. Um, I, was, I visited their new office in San Francisco yesterday. Oh, yeah, I saw And, and tried to emulate taking the same picture as their announcement picture the day before on the blog. Yeah. But without, but without Chris and, and Michael, <laughs> duplicated and cloned many times. <laughs> uh, and uh, I got to hang out with a bunch of uh, the, my ex-colleagues, and you know, it's 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 amazing. We we were talking, uh, and and it's like there's this really cool thing going on in the in the tech blog world, and I think you can relate to this. It's like once you've been a tech blogger, you're always a tech blogger in a way. You know? Yeah, and, and you, you're you must be experiencing that quite a bit because you're still very much in this world. Despite well, I mean, I've I've made a conscious effort to kind of rekindle my blog, who was very dormant while I was at Engadget, but TankGirl.com was started, you know, in 2006, right? So. Yeah, and, and back then, I tell you, it was a lot easier to get good traffic because now the competition is unreal. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I have to say that uh, people are getting into it now. It's uh, either very difficult to break through or, uh, you know, in a way easier because once you you poke through that, that you know, the noise, people will notice you much faster and you're much, like, much more likely to get uh, uh, attention and page, page views and, and YouTube uh, views and stuff. And it's really changed so much in the, you know, what is it now? Uh, eight years I've been doing this, you know? I imagine so, because I remember, you know, I, I think I started reading Tech Blocks around 02 when I, when, you know, when dumb phones started getting really fancy with color screens. I was still in diapers. Blue, blue LEDs. And yeah, Taylor was, <laughs> Taylor was just learning how to eat solid food. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, no. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, I, it has certainly changed a lot. And I, every time I go to an event, like a you know at a trade show when there's a, a sub event like you know Pepcom or something like that, and the invitation exclusively says press only. You can't even bring a, a spouse, but you still you walk in the door and there's 500 people there and everyone there is press yep. or an exhibitor and you're like wow this is this is just exploded. So yeah, I, it's I think insane. Right. We and we have some questions later on. By the way, listeners, we're going to get to listener mail this week after skipping it a, a, a couple weeks in a row back there. We're going to get to a couple, including a few that are asking about this kind of inside baseball stuff. So, don't worry about that. And a word of warning to our fragile, the, the more fragile component of our audience: if you missed last week's show, we do have exchanged our clean tag for an explicit one, not because we want to be a rollicking sailor bar, but because. Uh, <laughs> It was just getting too intense to edit. And also, you know, hey, we're grown-ups, right? No shit. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought Miriam would be the perfect one to usher us into this new era. So um, <laughs> let's go ahead and, uh, and kick off the show with uh, – we have a few announcements. So let's do that. Let's, let's get through these brief announcements. Our Nokia X giveaway winner 
is has been determined. We have uh, drawn a name from a hat with the help of our Rafflecopter widget powered by random.org. And someone is going to be walking away with this fluorescent green Nokia X that is currently in Joe Levi's hands so that he can put a uh, show everyone how to put an Android launcher on it. So, Miriam, have you spent any time with the Nokia X? Um, yes, I have. I actually have three of them. Whoa. <laughs> well, so it's a long story. but yeah, uh, What's the story there? Um, so you know that Pebble is, um, has a partnership with, uh, with Microsoft in terms of getting uh, – uh, well, with Nokia, I should say, and now Microsoft, in terms of yeah. getting, uh, yeah. in terms of being an Android developer. So we, we, when uh, when Nokia announced the X series, we we reached out to Nokia and said, hey, you know, I mean, I should say I reached out to Nokia and said, hey, you know, we want to make sure that the Pebble app works properly uh, on this Android device. So nice. is there any way you can uh, send us some devices? So obviously, you know, this was after the announcement of Mobile Congress. I was there, you were there, right. um, but. Within a few days of that, we, we got some prototypes in-house. So obviously I wasn't able to talk about it, and you'll, you'll see that I didn't talk about it. But I have been playing with we, – we got a few, so my developers are mostly the ones playing with them. But Sweet. I've had a chance to take one for a spin. Uh, in fact, the one the – one, so one of the ones I got was er- – Early on enough firmware that you could root it pretty easily with one of the standard rooted uh, routing APKs av- yeah. available out there, and I was able to install the Google Play components. Um, following a hack that was published somewhere, I remember seeing that hack. Yeah, that was way right. Early. And so I did all that, and launcher. and in, and it worked. Now the current firmware that ships, I don't know about the model you're giving away. I know you re- you you unboxed it on on the air mm-hmm. on on a YouTube video, but um, I think it's anything that's 1.0 you can root 1.1 and up. I think. Is uh, is not rootable. Hair, I mean, yeah. at least nobody's. I'm sure it's going to be rootable. You know, everything is always hackable in some <laughs> yeah. way. But I mean, not easily. And so I, I was lucky to try it out that way. And and you know, there's still not enough RAM to install Google Plus, for example. Yeah, so it wouldn't, really? it wouldn't let. Yeah, it wouldn't let me do that. Um, oh. But everything else, I got Jeez. pretty much on there. I got the Play Store. I got G- G- Gmail. Uh, you know, you know a calendar, all that stuff. And did that? I mean, it all ran fine. I mean, you had because you, you had to yep. put on the Enough. Google Play services, right? Everything the, ran fine. I followed that tutorial that somebody published on the web, and um, and it worked like a charm. In fact, the one device I'm still using, I haven't upgraded to 1.1. It still has all that stuff on it. Wow. Um, and my my colleagues have uh, upgraded to the latest firmware. Obviously, they want to make sure that uh, the Pebble app works with. Uh, the latest that people are going to be using. And I'll, we also have an Excel prototype, but I can obviously not talk about that in detail sure. uh, because it's not out yet. Um, yeah, but what, the takeaway, answer. here's my takeaway on the X, on the X if you want to know. Yeah, please. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's a little slow, I think. Um, it is and that's 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 the UI. thing that, I, and I mean, it's, it's even worse once you install Google Play stuff. Is it um, really? Yeah. So. So I think for the price, it's it's it's. I mean, that, it's doesn't what doesn't that surprise you though? I mean, it's a Snapdragon S four at one gigahertz. It, it does surprise me very much. I think it's just they just need to optimize things yeah. very much, and I think it's a combination of the skin and some other probably some other services that are running back in the background. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't seem to like. I mean, I haven't found a way to remove. You know, like I'd be interesting to see if Cyanogen mod on this thing. Yeah, how how yeah. well it runs because I mean it's a it's an S four play it's a dual core one point one gigahertz processor right, right? yeah like, um, I mean, it, should it be could be a RAM way. thing you know I noticed that the XL is a bit faster and it's the same hardware but more RAM that could well so be. so I don't know I mean the bottom line to me is that I think this once the street price of this device goes below a hundred U S dollars which you, you know it will very soon right. Um, because it's what, 150, 100 and something like that. We have the, uh, the actual retail price on the link, which I didn't see. I didn't link the thing in the rundown, so I can't click <laughs> on it. Right. So I don't know, but yeah, it's, um, it's in that neighborhood. And if, once the price comes down, it's going to, I think for a hundred bucks, you know, if you want to maybe put another OS on there, like Cyanogen, it's, it's the hardware is, is great. It's Nokia hardware. And I mean, it's, it's low end Nokia hardware, but it's still, I get oh, that really amazing build quality. And it's that wonderful, um, like it, it, sweet spot between sort of cute, but rugged, you know, it, absolutely. It, it strikes me as the kind of phone you'd take with you on a hiking trip or something like that. And just kind of not worry about beating it up because it's going to handle totally. things. I mean, this would be a great phone to keep in your glove box as an emergency phone sure. and still have a smartphone with potential 
architectural data connectivity. Also, although in the U.S., you're only going to get edge on this. So yeah, which is true. But it was fun though because it, it's dual SIM enabled. So I was able to throw in an AT and T SIM in one slot. And a T Mobile. Yeah, yeah, this yeah I did that too. I've ever done that. Is I'm, it cool? Oh, what a good time! Yeah. Yeah. So basically, my takeaway is, you know, the hardware is is, is typical Nokia, rugged, well built, uh, beautiful. I think the industrial design, I like it a lot. Um, mm-hmm. The camera, of course, is fixed focus. It's good in daylight, but it's not you know, nothing to scream home right. about or anyway. The XL has autofocus, five megapixel, and it's it's quite a bit better. It's quite a step um, up. But but the the point is that uh, the, the, other than the speed issues and the fact that you know if the, it's it's so customized, it's not doesn't really feel like Android because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think. There's going to be some good potential for hack for the hackers out there to make this a very viable sub one hundred dollar Android phone. And once the, somebody you know finds a way to put a, a bootloader on there and and, and get s- Cyanogen. There's been so much like pent up demand for an Android phone made by Nokia. You know, I, I feel like the uh, the performance issues and the kind of the low resolution, the limitation of the hardware are not going to be enough to sort of stifle the uh, the excitement around this phone. I mean, to me, it's a clear. Now that I've played with it, it's a clear. It's a clear, it's very clear to me that they're going to replace the Asha line with these devices. Really? Because the, yeah, because see, the Ashas are, the, the, the OS Asha runs is not, doesn't scale well to some of the more modern services that Microsoft would want on there, like Drive sure. uh, or, or Ma- Here Maps or, um, you know, what else is on there? The, 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 the Nokia s- Music One, stuff, one the... Drive and the, the mixed radio stuff. Right. Um, so, so the problem with it, Asha is that you know, and you, you also it's single, still single core. Ash, I don't think their OS supports dual core devices. So I think that they're going to f- kind of reach a ceiling as what, what they can do with the Asha software. And the hardware is becoming so cheap so quickly that, you know, they either need to run Windows Phone or or Android. And of course, they don't want to give us a, a true Android experience because, you know, Microsoft wants <laughs> Microsoft to push us to into. That. Yeah, they want to yeah. push us into their ecosystem. This, this, which I, this is part of the confusion for me, Mary. It's like. It's like we talked a little bit about this last week, but you have a company which has made the Lumia 520 and the 525 and the 521, which is a really wonderful Windows phone. I think the 525 is is a much better choice. Yeah, and I think like the 520 and 521, bucks. yeah, they don't have enough RAM. But the 525, I think, is a much better choice than the Nokia X ultimately. And maybe that's the, that's the ploy, right? Maybe that's the trick. Is like they want the Nokia they X want, is like they want bad. well, not intentionally, but I think they want. They want to replace Asha, but they want to make it so that people it kind of experience the services and maybe realize, well, you know, once I have a bit more money, I'm going to go get a, a Windows phone device because it's going to be a better experience That's an with the take. same services. I mean, you know, this is I, I've you know, we've all discussed this since the original announcement. There's many different potential strategies here and it's a very different now especially that now that nokia is, is completely integrated in microsoft right um i for all we know they're just going to can this thing you know i know that's what I i've mean, been thinking i'm like is this going to um, be a one-of-a-kind line is it these three but the other thing is you know nokia is very persistent i wouldn't be surprised if there's a next generation of nokia x products before they can it and that that next generation fixes some of these performance issues in fact i wouldn't even be surprised if it's just firmware updates that are going to fix some of the performance things but i have to say right now as stands it's a great piece of hardware for the price but the software needs a lot of polish and improvement even if you can live even if you accept the fact that this is a weird highly skinned version of android and you can live without all the google tie-in right right um and that's the other big hurdle for for us, I think. But that's because we're not the target market, right? I right, mean, if you exactly. look at you have a dual SIM phone, at, that's yeah. And for, so that's I think that's why I don't want to like get too aggro about that with with right. people because it's like I anybody who doesn't understand that just you know forget it. Like, don't even start talking about the Nokia Nokia X if you don't <laughs> yeah. understand. It's been fun to watch it's, the comments. It's not. Like, right, it's not like meant to be. A, it's not a meant to run play services and, and no. any of that. So. Well, I, I hope that uh, that our winner finds some some compelling use for it. I don't know what part of the world uh, he is in, but I'm going to go ahead and say his name, and uh, we're going to reach out to him shortly after the show. Uh, Taylor, would you help me in a, a poor man's drum roll, please? There you go. That's very nice. <laughs> winner nice. of the Nokia X from Pocket Now is Uzer Tariq. That's the best I could do. Uh, I made sure we had first name and last name so there was no confusion after last time. Uzair, congratulations. <laughs> uh, we are going to be reaching out to you via email. We have all your information. All you needed to do, folks, to enter this giveaway was to follow Negri Electronics and Pocket Now on Twitter. 
uh, and there were a couple of things you could do, but Uzer wins. So congratulations, sir, and we'll have your Nokia X in the mail to you soon. Um, and, and, you know, I, I want to pin Negri, because I know that you're obviously you're partnering with him here, but yeah. I want I want to, uh, from an outside voice person here, I cannot, you know, say how many times Ryan and his team have hooked us up and helped us out. These yeah, guys right. care. They're hardcore. They're really, they're really serious about um, you know this kind of tech, the tech, the tech they sell, and it is it is true. We've we have a, a long history with Negri, and they're they're just uh, they're, they're they're wonderful to work with. So we thank them one last time before we the, send out the Nokia X, and I sort of miss it. Like I said, I went to Joe Levi's office, and uh, for all its kind of quirks, I it's just fun to put that phone in a breast pocket and just kind of go out and be like, all right, I'm not going to worry about this too much. But it's a giveaway it's, phone, so I have to. But if I did, if it wasn't, <laughs> I mean, it's significant enough that I think you know it's something we're talking about, and we're, we're going to remember this moment, whether or not you know they they can it or what. Oh, agreed. Um, yeah, either way, because one way it's going to be the start of something really interesting. In another way, it's going to be a standalone thing that you put in a case and say, "Hey, remember that one time?" Yeah, and so Microsoft if you have. Can. Yeah, well, mm. exactly. <laughs> Microsoft Kin. Oh, well, no, it's, maybe. But Microsoft Kin was like way it. worse, though. So. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was. It was. But that's all I was thinking of that the was entire my favorite. time you guys were talking. I'm just like, ah. The Ken. That was yeah. my favorite uh, header <laughs> header photo to take or uh, YouTube thumb when I was making the Worst Gadgets Ever episode about the Ken. And I just kind of like, I, I took a shot of it almost going into a trash can, which was, it was just a lot of fun. And I felt, I feel bad for that product still today. But uh, the Nokia X is not the only X phone uh, of note today. This is kind of just a PSA. We're not going to really dwell on it. But if you want to buy a Moto X, now is the time to do it. That is, if you're getting it from Motorola, they're doing, I think they're positioning it as a Mother's Day sale. Isn't that correct? Yeah. They're um, taking a slight amount of money off, starting at $299.99. So fifty dollars off. It's a fifty dollar discount. Thank you. Customize a Moto X with no contract for mom or yourself, and save up to one hundred and twenty five dollars. Yeah, that's the marketing speak. But yeah, fifty bucks off the base price for the um, sixteen gig version. Thirty two gig is three twenty four ninety nine. Developer edition is the same price. So oh, so the the the, the, uh, the, the thirty two gig is what seventy dollars off then? Yeah, because what is this normally three ninety nine? Three ninety nine, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And are I, they what a beauty? Go ahead. Are they are they clearing house for the upcoming Moto E? Do you think? I was going to say. Now we have a uh, that's in the rundown a little bit later. But is, is that what you're expecting? The uh, the this not really. I mean, I'm not sure what to expect. To me, I mean, uh, the E. I think of the E as maybe a mid range device, and like I'm thinking maybe Moto a uh, kind of a halfway between Moto X and Moto G specs. But everybody's saying it's a thinner device as well. So it'll be interesting to see. It is, yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying watching Motorola play alphabet soup. And at, at some point, uh, you know, when the Lenovo acquisition was announced, I was kind of like, oh, man, we're gonna, now it's going to dry up in the pipeline as we get, go through acquisition pains and all that stuff. Um, and I kind of didn't expect to see another Motorola device for a while. But, of course, then they announced a slew of new devices, or they didn't announce, but they've started breaking cover. And... You know, Nokia, to go back to Nokia for a second, really disproved my entire fear about that whole thing, where it's like uh, when Nokia was about to get acquired by Microsoft, I was like, oh, here we go. We're not going to see another Nokia device for ages. And then they, <laughs> they dropped, what, like 25? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's crazy. So I'm excited to see whatever it's going to be. But if you want... So that's a good point, Miriam. If you are any kind of, like, bleeding-edge person... <laughs> First of all, you wouldn't be considering the Moto X anyway, but second of all, um, you probably are going to want to wait to see what they're bringing to the to the barn. But Taylor, are you going to say something before we uh, close out the announcements? Um, no. I thought you were. I thought you were like, I just oh. I was just going to say that I love the G. I think I still think the G for the price point. You know, we were talking about the Moto X, uh, sorry, the Nokia X being an affordable phone, Android phone, and I'm sorry, but and even we're talking about the 525 being a, a better choice. Yeah. I say screw all that. Get a Moto G because but the Moto G is still like 179 though, right? I mean, it's Yeah, but it's, but it's yeah. like you can buy you maybe buy a used one. I mean, the point is that you can't go wrong. Like you're getting mm -hmm. Nexus 4 levels of performance for $179 new. It's so true. I, I, yeah, I, it's a it's a better value. Yeah. This I mean, those... save up a few more pennies if you're spending a hundred. Sure. I mean, I don't know how much you you were saying the price of the of the five twenty X, you know, whatever the five twenty series of. Uh, well, how much? How much are they selling for? I am finding that out right now. Like unsubsidized, because obviously I know you can get a subsidy for like nothing, probably. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. More but I think it's like the list price is one fifty, I think, or one seventy five. 
What, for the 520. 525, it's 120? Well, so pay, like, seriously, can you not save an extra $50? No, to, I mean, in our markets, sure. But, I, you know, if you're talking about... Dude, right, no, no, but I'm talking about here. We're, we're obviously talking about the Moto, Moto X and Moto E now. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, that's, I want to, I want to give my love for the Moto G simply because it, it is so affordable. No, it's true. It's affordable, and the the performance is better than it has any business being. We talk about this on the show pretty often, but where Taylor like gets the Moto G in for review, and I'm like, okay, whatever, you can have that. I'm sure it's a piece. <laughs> and then four days later, he's like, no, this is really good. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So I take it for an afternoon, and I'm like, wow. I can really this is do really most good. things that I want to do with this phone. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, God. Yeah, he, he doesn't believe a word I say. No, ever. I do now. That was the moment. That was the moment, oh. Taylor. Trust bloomed between us. Uh, <laughs> the final bit of announcements here is that we have an HTC One M8 Harmon K drone, as I like to call it, Harmon Carton Edition in the house. And we unboxed it last night. I don't remember what time it was, it was very, very late. And we are going to be testing it, which means I'm going to be testing it, which means I need your help because I am not an audiophile, folks. So, 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 well, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. I mean, I am a big audio person. I'm telling you right you? now, there's nothing about the Harman Kardon version that's any different from the regular M8 in terms of audio quality. Well, in terms I mean, of hardware, yeah, but they've got that soft, the new software layer they're sampling. Whatever. At a you know that doesn't. Or... <laughs> well, come on. The, 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 M8, the existing M8 can do 24 bit playback. That's all you need to know. No, but... I mean, yeah, it can do 24 bit, but the the uh, the sample rate is is 190 up to 192, and I think the that's regular a hardware stops thing. That's at not 96. A soft thing. That's a, that's a hardware thing. If it if it can do this on the Harman Kardon edition, it can do this on the regular M8. I've been playing Flax at at, at uh, uh, you know like 98. 24 on my M8 for since the day I got it. I've been doing that on the M7 as no a matter kidding. of fact. See, yeah, um, I mean, actually, not the M7 because the M7 tops out at 44 or 48. But the um, the first one that did that was the G2 from LG. Yes, and, and right? the commenters have been vocal 24. about reminding and us about that. And it sounds fantastic. It's one of the best. And you know what? The Nexus 5 inherits all of that. Oh, right, because of the yeah. And the, so, the, 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 uh, the but the M8, um, the M7 could do 24 bit. The M8 does uh, higher sample rates, as far as I know, natively, if you use a native player. But and in, it supports flag. Those do not come with, first of all, they don't come in jet black with, with, yes, and they don't come accents. with the branding. And, and but who wants Sprint? And <laughs> that's the real question because you know I've had this thing for about a day and I'm it's sitting right next to me. Actually, I, I'm enjoying uh, many aspects of it, but man, uh, God, I watching watching Sprint continually, you know, try like fight. I love watching uh, a disadvantaged party fight, and th so that's wonderful. So watching them rebrand their LTE offering to sort of Sprint Spark has been interesting. But man, it, I just I can't get indoor performance. I, I cannot get uh, building penetration. The network performance is not up to par for where I'm right now. Fortunately, I'm going out of town this weekend. I'm going to see what I can do about learning how the network performs elsewhere. And, we'll and I live in the heart of a Sprint LTE network. I mean, just it, if you check a coverage map, it is just it's a blanket coverage over this entire city, and. Um, the Boost Max. I had that thing, and technically it should have used Sprint's LTE network. I was stuck on 2G the entire time. Two different units. Yeah, you had a pretty rough time. <laughs> but I want to say, before we start dogging this thing too much, you know what this, this M8 comes with in the box that the regular M8 does not? Good headphones? Yeah. Uh, these, I'm holding them right now. The Harman What are Garden. they? Um, Harman Kardon? Yeah, of course. Yeah, they're, and they're the in-ear ones. Uh, HTC is quoting a retail price of 150 on these. Now, on the website, that has a strike through through it, and they're like 70 bucks. But either way, it's they're worlds better than you're going to get from the like stock OEM earbuds that we are count ourselves lucky to get anyway, normally. Yeah. So I think that's – I don't know if that will be enough to push anybody over the ledge on this, but I, I so. So I'm just reading the Verge's um, article on this on this phone, and it looks like yeah. the, I mean there is additional software, but you have to understand when it comes to audio, software is generally just a gimmick. The hardware is really what matters, and the hardware is no different here. So the software looks like they have this ClearFi software, and yeah. from what I'm reading, the description of what they're doing is they're they're oversampling, upsampling, low sample or normal sample rate audio to 192, which will make a difference. Uh, but that's only making a difference on audio you have that's not at 
at high bit rates and high high sample rates. I mean, and so uh, you know, you it's like if you play if you uh, listen to your Mac with headphones, uh, and you Macs all play back up to ninety eight kilohertz. Right. Um, you know, uh, audio. Uh, so what, what I would do is, is, um, if you, if you, there's a app on the Mac, I don't know if you guys know this, it's called the MIDI audio setup. On Taylor mm-hmm. would know it probably. Uh, audio MIDI setup. If you go to audio MIDI setup, you can actually change the, the, the sample rate to uh, 96 or, or, uh, uh, 88, for example, I keep saying 98, I meant 96, 96 kilohertz, uh, is the generally the max on most built-in sound cards on the max. Okay. So if you're listening with headphones, say, change that to 96, even on audio you're listening to that's only 48 or 44. Yeah. Most of your audio is going to be 44 if it's MP3. Yeah, we do 44. And, one and it actually video. will imp- it will actually improve sound quality a little bit because there's a built-in sample rate converter uh, in the Mac codec software that will basically you know smooth out the audio and give you slightly better. Uh, reproduction uh, oversampling upsampling is a well-known technique to make things sound better you, it's marginally better but you'll hear it that's so that's what this clear file that's what this clear file does yeah, but, but that's only for content that's like normal mp3 or 44 or a 48 kilohertz content that makes sense because that's what they're pushing with this right because Sprint is pushing right. the Spotify partnership where it's but like technically hey, no, you should be able to like get the APK um off of that device and put it on any M8, you know? Totally, yeah, for, for people like us, yeah. But I'm just wondering, you know, I'm interested in what this, whether this will, in fact, move the needle at all for Sprint because Sprint can now come out and say, you know, whether it's slightly disingenuous or not, we have an M8 that can do uh, what the other M8s cannot do. Uh, come for sure. And, come, you know, come to us. I but but what I'm saying is that if you're a really serious audiophile, you're already listening to FLAC. You're already listening to FLAC at 96.24 or 192.24. And the HTC One as it is today can handle that. Or you just go out and get a uh, pre-order of, what is that thing called? A, a Pone? No. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what it's called. <laughs> the, the, Neil, uh, <laughs> the, the, the special uh, pod. Oh, come on. What am I talking about? That, that high fidelity uh, iPod competitor. Oh yeah, yeah, I know the one you talk about, but I can't remember the name either. Ugh. Yeah, it's like it's, it's like it's like pwn music or or porn music or something like something that. like that. <laughs> it's it's but, totally but, porn I mean, music. The, the bottom line is there are many tricks you can use on many devices today to improve audio quality. The biggest thing you can do is get a really really good pair of headphones or earbuds. Pwned Honestly, up. that is right half the battle. Forget the sample rates, the fact that it's flat versus MP3. Sure, all that is tiny little incremental improvements, but the biggest one you can do is is that. So, Would you buy these uh, these earphones separately? Do you have any uh, experience with them? I have recommendations, yeah. Uh, my my two-go in-ear headphones, uh, earphones, are anemotic research. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't buy anything less than the HF2 or HF3, which are iPod, iPhone compatible through HF2 and Android, Windows phone compatible for the HF3. Although the HF3 will work with an iPhone, you just don't get the volume. This is, uh, we should talk audio more on this podcast because I've never heard so many acronyms in like a five-minute span. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me, let me rephrase that. I think it's the, HF, the HF2s are the uh, – the, the HF2 basically just have a button for pause, unpause, you know, and for talk and a microphone in line. Right. The HF3s have, are specific to the iOS devices. So they have the pause, unpause, um, you know – a hang up yeah, call button thing. with the mic, but they also have a volume up and volume down button, just like yeah, a same with these. Uh, yeah. So, so, Atomic Research HF2, HF3, check them out. They're, I think, the best for the money. Like, you can't, you can spend more for sure, but you're not going to get much more in sound quality for in ear. Um, they're the best, they're the best company out there. They, they, they come from the hearing aid world, world so they know. They know what to do. Okay. Um, I, I worked in hearing research. Um, one of my first jobs was when I was still in university. What haven't uh, you done? I've done lots of things. <laughs> I haven't gone to the moon yet. Um, <laughs> yet. yet. But, but, uh, but uh, these guys, before they started making earphones for, uh, for, you know, for consumers and professionals, like stage in, in-ear monitors and stuff, mm-hmm. they used to make hearing aids and hearing test equipment. So um, I got familiar with doing. their equipment early. Yeah, they totally know what they're doing. And so they, they, they also make a really high-end one called the um, ER4 series. There's a bunch of different models uh, with different EQ curves based on what your preferences are and what kind of listening style you, you have, like professional work or 
guitar versus classical music versus, you know, portable equipment versus studio equipment, right. different impedances, different frequency responses. Those are much more expensive. And you get 99% of the performance of the high-end ER4s with this, this HF2 and HF3 series I'm talking about. And then for um, standard headphones, I recommend Bayer Dynamics, particularly the 770, yeah. 880, and 990s. Taylor, so I you've have, struck right a nerve now, with Taylor. Right now, I'm, I'm wearing 990 Pro. Uh, I'm doing the podcast. I like this because they're open, so you can still if people talk to you, you can hear them talk to you, and uh, also you, it's a bit more airflow, so you you don't feel <laughs> like you're sweating completely insanely. It's an insanely warm day here in San Francisco for for us. It's unusually like in the 80s, and it's a little warm in my apartment right now. And I have the have the windows closed for the podcast, so having oh. the 990s on is comfortable. I sort of wish I had eat. those on because while we're bragging about our equipment, let me tell you guys that I <laughs> what I, are you using? I'm I'm rocking a seven year old pair of Sony uh, MDR NC6 headphones, which uh, they're good ones, though. You know, they're okay, but after an hour and a half, my ears are plastered yeah, to my skull. Sweating. They're covered in sweat, and uh, these things yeah. are falling apart. They're doing that thing where the uh, you know the foam kind of like drifts down onto my shoulders <laughs> in a fine <laughs> dust coating. So you know? you know, most of headphones like like that, you can buy replacement pads. I know. Um, I have to. Get like them. Uh, the Bayer Dynamics are made of velvet. What? Which is really nice. Yeah. yeah. You can put velvet on your ears. Yeah, they're, they're oh, velvet. Oh my god. Yeah. And, and they're replaceable. So my my pair of headphones is actually 15 years old. The uh, I just have I just put a new cord on recently and replaced 15 the 15 uh, years old. Replaced the velvets. Yeah, that's amazing. I've got another brand new pair at the office for my for Pebble, so I don't have to commute and bring my headphones uh, when I go to the office. And uh, they sound. Yeah, I tell you, there's pretty much no difference. 15 years or not doesn't make any difference for that quality of headphone. <laughs> Yeah, everybody knows that I use my uh, Audio Technica ATHM50s for everything. That's right. They're you are very so good. Love them. good at saying that brand name quickly now, Taylor. <laughs> yeah. so Audio Technica. <laughs> I would recommend. Here are some of the brands I recommend, just off the top of my head. So, Edemotic for in ear, particularly. Sure is pretty good. Um, what are the other brands for in ear? Um, there is uh, that one starts with a V. It's like a Oh, uh, um, they I do professional grade studio quality stuff. Again, they're they're not like a mainstream brand, but they're they're very very high quality. Darren Murph, uh, the Engadget ex Engadget yeah. editor, uh, wrote a had a, did like a whole story behind them and got went to their factory and got uh, molds made for his ears. And I can't remember. Oh, that's uh, anyway. Just that level of search, customization is really search awesome. for Darren Murph Engadget uh, ear earphones or something and you'll i'm sure you'll find the article I'm, um I'm, then for for headphones bear dynamic audio technica makes some good stuff akg is another good choice sennheiser yes, um, basically companies that have been around for a really long time and i hate to tell you guys but beats doesn't cut it okay <laughs> all right like, i gotta say i'm really pleased to see that we are we are at the end of the beats here of course we knew this a while ago but it just bears repeating i'm really happy you, i don't, you I don't a think harman carden brand on the back of a phone i'm fine with it but it's i don't think we're past beats, beats man we're past beats in this every sense day we were before Every day no, I have somebody ask me about beats. Yeah, but that's because it's, but that's still passing. it's still passing. That's why we have to That's why we have to remind everyone yeah. that we're past beats. Okay, guys. Right. <laughs> Just letting you uh, know. And because I'm very conscious of of, uh, of a time limitation we have, I do. I want to move on because there's there's another area of your expertise that I want to get to, Miriam, which is photography. But uh, in between here and there. Uh, is a little talk about fitness, and this is kicked off by uh, Jonathan Michael, who wrote into us. And we used to have something called a thought thread on this podcast. I'm bringing it back with this episode. <laughs> Formerly, it was thought up by an editor before we went on the air, but uh, now we're going to use a piece of listener mail to kick us off on a bit of a, uh, a thought exercise journey, which I think will be fun. So, Taylor, would you care to read oh, Jonathan gosh. Michael's email uh, as quickly mm -hmm. as you can? And by that, I mean, you know, comfortably. This is going to take a while. Make us feel <clears throat> good. That's all right. You, you go ahead and read the first paragraph. I'll take the second one. Here's the thought thread. Hi, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, hi, guys. I listened to this week's podcast, and I kind of like the way or that way besides who doesn't have a trucker's mouth moment in their life. Yeah, this Everyone... is related to the, uh, the <laughs> yeah. explicit tag. Yes. Yeah. Everyone gets pissed, right? Enough of the rambling. Do you think that the next frontier in the mobile tech is fitness or, and health, or it will just go away just like 3D TVs and smartphones? I think there's a huge potential to this as part of the so-called Internet of Things. The Galaxy S5, despite its shortcomings, included a heart rate monitor. 
The entire Samsung Gear lineup also has it, and the iWatch is also rumored to be focused on fitness as Nike just killed the fuel band. The iPhone 5S also has an M7 coprocessor, which is meant for fitness apps like Nike Running, which I use a lot. Nice. And I lied about the second paragraph because uh, basically Jonathan is just saying he's not really sold on the fitness tracker thing. And uh, do you think that we're coming up on an, on an era where you can take a photo of your food and an app can tell how many calories are there and tell you that your pants are becoming tight? Maybe you shouldn't get that. Yeah. So I, I, I think this is this is great. I, the thrust of this entire question is something I've been thinking about an awful lot, which is what is the role of fitness going to be when it comes to smartphones going forward? And I had a, t- a chance to explore this in a bit of detail earlier in the week when I took the uh, I took Samsung's Galaxy S5 out on the town with the Gear Fit, and I used S Health to the max. I, I prodded every corner of that software to see how I could integrate it into my life and see what a normal person like me who doesn't really like working out but likes to be active could do with it. And it's a powerful piece of software, so. I came away thinking that while it's not perfect, and there's a lot I would change about it, actually, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that there's, there's something really compelling about offering fitness as a, uh, or focusing on fitness as an area of, of expertise. And I think Samsung's got, sort of got the jump on it. And I want to know what you guys think. Do you, is this just a flash in the pan, as Jonathan suggests, or is there some kind of future in this? Are we going to see manufacturers compete at this, on this particular element? I, th- I think it's something that's going to stick around for a while. It's not going to disappear overnight like 3D because it has an actual use in the real world. 3D on phones and 3D TVs, I, I was never compelled by those. and never really – it never brought anything extra to me, just depth that didn't really bring me into movies. It didn't add anything to television. It just kind of – it was there. It was a novelty. Yeah. Um, this has a real world use case that can benefit lives However, um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because my girlfriend challenged me to lose weight um, with her. She challenged you? She challenged me. Uh, she said she wanted to lose weight. I said I wanted to lose weight, so she challenged me. Wow. Yeah. So and, that's uh, a good like, way to do it. Yeah, it is a good yeah. way. So are you guys like racing toward a – you're each, each like targeting a threshold or something? Yeah, we both set goals last night. So we, she challenged me weeks ago, and then we kind of fell off the train like two days <laughs> That's later. That's a tough thing to, to stay on top of, man. Just it like, is. Oh. So she challenged me again last night. We both set our goal weights and a deadline. And we have to come up with what happens if, you know, what the loser has sure. to do. Are you, using, are you using an app to do that? Spanking or? happens. <laughs> yeah. Spanking. No, that's a I reward. That's punish- See, is that's that the, punishment? Yeah, that's problem. Gonna... Uh, <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. Not in San Francisco, I tell you that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was thinking about it actually earlier today. Like, hey, I really miss my Fitbit. I've got to figure out something else where I can track this stuff a little more closely and, and watch because I was actually just watching your video this morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's the thing. Like I don't really care for something that's integrated in the phone or oh, – I'm not a fan of the ecosystem within ecosystems. So this being specific to Samsung or HTC or Apple or what, whatever it may be, I'm, I'm kind of the third-party guy because I like yeah. to be able to use Fitbit with Android or iOS – I feel um, you. I was using yeah. a third-party app called Lose It for a while that I really quite enjoyed, and I could install that on any Android phone. So yeah, having to being tethered to S Health is kind of non-appealing to me. Um, I actually just installed that on my iPhone too. So what? what uh, Lose It? Yes, it's a great app. It's it's so. it's not perfect. It's a great app. Uh, and Miriam just got back from a vacation. Can I tell people where you went? Sure, absolutely. Yosemite, and so mm-hmm. you were in the great outdoors. I know you go to Burning Man. You spend a lot of time outside. I mean, do you do you ever, you know, use? I know Pebble supports um, pedometer and stuff. Yeah, like that. so I mean, I mean, not not to toot our own horn, but obviously, I think uh, we are. I think at Pebble, we look at it as third parties should be the ones with the expertise to make this happen. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm sure that, you know, like Apple and Samsung, all other companies obviously have lots of people in house who know what they're doing in terms of fitness. And that's how they can implement those features. But um, I think it's going to become a big deal. I think that there's no doubt that in the future, our wearable and portable devices will uh, help us, um, you know, live better lives in terms of nutrition and, and, and health and exercise. 
if we so choose. Um, and so I think it's, I'm really, uh, I'm really happy to see this kind of uh, getting more and more traction, whether you're wearing a fitness band or a watch like Pebble or a, you know, you're just using your smartphone, like with uh, what Apple's doing with the M7 mm -hmm. motion processor. I think, I mean, ultimately it's a, it's a, it's an important part of, of the of the the mobile and wearable ecosystem and it's not going to go away i think in five years we're going to look back and say you know like of course you do this right like i mean everybody will be everybody will be measuring their you know their health and fitness in some way whether it's you know like super active you know gym bunny type thing where people we really like to exercise and or if it's just a casual, I want to monitor my health, you know, and see right. where I'm at. Yeah, and, extreme and, it's like and maybe I, maybe I won't have that second Twinkie right now kind of thing. <laughs> right, you know? right. I so speaking of Twinkies myself. and Yosemite, we were at Yosemite, uh, my spouse and I, and, and uh, at the uh, general store there in the Yosemite Village. The first thing we ran into walking in was Twinkies. Wait, there's a Yosemite Village? I know nothing about Yosemite. So there's a village? Yeah, the little village there, and um, cool. well, it's it's you know it's part. It's like so it's 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 federal uh, uh, national parkland, park right? Yeah. So it's a concession, basically. It's a little tiny little town that pre-exists the na the fact that it was that it's oh. a national park, but it's very touristy oriented, and all the you know it's it's the concessions. Uh, uh, the concept of a concession is basically if you're in a, in a, in a national park, uh, a vendor is allowed to set up. Um, a store or some kind of business sure in yeah, the park sense. but they don't really own the property like you know what i'm saying because it's it's federal it's lands eminent domain stuff correct yeah but i mean so they have a general store and we walked in and twinkies was and we looked at each other like really seriously <laughs> like we're in yosemite like you know people here are hiking and stuff and did you should did you, you really be selling twinkies did you pick up some twinkies no. No, you remained no. opposed to it. You didn't say, what we is did. this? And then you just like. It was very oh. tempting, though, because you know how Hostess went out of business for a while and you couldn't find Twinkies so, anywhere? Uh, yeah, I remember that. And was we terrifying. don't go out of our way to eat Twinkies. It's just they were right in our face and we're in Yosemite and we're like, oh. Exactly. And they're like, a, they're a staple of society. You know, it's like. I know. They're thing. like, exactly. It's like totally a cultural thing yeah. at this point. So I don't know. I mean, Yosemite is, is wonderful. It's my first time there. My spouse has been a few times. If you ever get a chance to go, it's, it's amazing. If you are in San Francisco next time for an event, or something it's only a four-hour drive so maybe rent a car um exactly and I mean. and you know even if you are time limited or whatever uh just uh maybe leave early in the morning you can get there by midday hike around for the rest of the day until it's dark and then drive back like you don't have to even have to stay for the night you can kind of experience it once it is breathtaking uh the views of the, the, nat the nature is so amazingly beautiful and um did you, you know uh, the thing did you make use of like i mean did you make use of any kind of like health tracking thing while you were there um I mean, I no i mean i have i just have my my the pedometer on my bubble that i use from time to time so i, I did keep track of like how many miles i'd walked and stuff and you know we That's didn't go fun. on speci we didn't go specifically on long hikes my spouse was recovering from being having a pretty nasty cold and yeah. we had booked this vacation like we rented a camper van we had booked a campground so we we didn't want to cancel everything Thing because he'd been ill but we um so we, we decided to just take it easy instead sure oh, we did like very short like one two mile hikes uh two or three times a day for the f three four days we were there to just keep it easy uh so nothing insane but i can tell you this since we're all a bunch of nerds here yeah um at and T is the only carrier you'll get signal on up there Really? Uh, so, so if you are going to Yosemite, bring an AT&T capable device, and it's pockets too. So it's like some parts you have no signal at all. Isn't that fun? And then like, some parts you have signal, and then when you do have signal, it's actually pretty good, and it's HSPA plus. Isn't it weird? I feel like th this is a really lame first world thing to say, but I find it um, exciting when I do not have service because now I have coverage everywhere where I live and work and everything. Right. There's no time when I don't have service. So when the phone sa actually says no service, and it's not because it's a crappy phone, it's because I'm in an area that is not covered by you know any kind of coverage whatsoever. I'm like, wow. Boy, this is this is kind of off the grid lifestyle. I should. I know, and so this water. is kind of like you know. There's always three, at least three different sims I bring with me for three carriers. I generally bring yeah. AT. AT and T, T Mobile, because T Mobile is my main sim. What's your and carrier? and Verizon. Oh yeah, they have sims. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, most of the modern Verizon devices are SIM-based now. Right. And, and so I, I hate to say it, but Sprint, nah, I don't really need it. Um, I mean, the, the chance of me being someplace where Sprint is the only choice is nil. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's my experience, right? Yeah. So, I mean, for I reviewing mean, and to, testing... To be fair, that's been my experience with T-Mobile, too, but, you know, well, it depends for absolute, on your market. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. But since T-Mobile is my main number, I always bring my SIM sure. with me, anyway, right? Sure. So, sure. But you're right. If, if I, When I travel out in the boonies, I can do this road trip pretty much once a year where we, my spouse and I drive from here to Vancouver, Canada, where I used to live, mm -hmm. and we stop and see all our friends along the way. And and we make a road trip out of it. And, you know, invariably, it's absolutely 100 percent sure that no matter where I am along I-5 or along the coast or if I do, if we do a little bit of an excursion into the into nature is that it's either AT&T or Verizon. Mm -hmm. That's how it goes. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of been the story in, in North America for a long time. And it's interesting to see T-Mobile and Sprint sort of battle it out for the third place, much mm -hmm. as Windows Phone and BlackBerry did on the platform side for a while, which was interesting. It's always but, interesting but, to see that. But here's what I have to say. You know, for me, the reason I'm a T-Mobile customer is because when I do get a good connection on T-Mobile, which is thankfully most of the time nowadays in uh, urban and suburban areas, mm -hmm. uh, it's LTE and it's and the fastest LTE fast. that I can get. Like it's just it blows away the competition in such a significant way that that's true. I mean, <laughs> that's right. I was in I'm, New York City after the Galaxy S5 launch event, and I was trying to upload a video on, and I was tethering on uh, T-Mobile and AT&T, and of course, it was lower Manhattan at like rush hour. at and had no chance, and I was just not. I was like, oh, like, oh, I have a T-Mobile sim. Toss this in there. I start going, and, and YouTube's like, sweet, I'll be done in three minutes, and it's just flying. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> and then yeah, T-Mobile, about 30 seconds into it, the network realized what I was doing, and it was like, no. <laughs> and the ETA went from like two minutes and 30 seconds to uh, something like 15,000 minutes. And oh. I was like, oh, no. That's that when you so just restart. Fun. You just restart it. Um, and now you know that the uploader for YouTube actually lets you – Let's it's you pretty resilient. It lets you change the connection. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's true. But I wasn't, I wasn't feeling particularly crafty, and I, oh, I was so bent out of shape about that. But uh, speaking of the Galaxy S5, though, uh, the uh, Google Play Edition Galaxy S5 looks to be launching soon, and. This is kind of another PSA, it's just to touch on this for listeners who are not aware of it. That looks imminent from everything we're seeing. And I put it in here to ask you, Miriam, if you uh, had any thoughts on the S5 in general. Is this is it um, a phone? Um, you, you know, I'm generally following? not a I'm not generally a big fan of Samsung devices. Uh, and it's nothing to do specifically with. It's just that, like, okay, the last phone that really was my kind of primary device from Samsung was the Galaxy S2. That Whoa. that phone defined that phone defined what a super phone was at the time. Because that's what the opinion. Galaxy S line was about back then. It was about. I mean, it was they were really pushing the envelope. Yeah. Uh, TouchWiz was very lightweight. Mm -hmm. uh, it was you know Exynos blew away everything else on the market in terms of dual core. The camera on that phone. And, and mark my words on this, okay, listeners, really mark my words. The Galaxy S2 camera was better than any Galaxy S camera after it. What? It was. That can't Absolutely. Be. Low light performance. The pixels were way bigger. Low light performance was way better than anything you get out of a GS3, GS4, GS5. Wow. And it's the speed that changed. Of course, you can take much faster pictures, 10 frames per second or whatever. Autofocus is faster. But honestly, it's about picture quality for me. You know, I'm and not that's why, to hear you that, know, because low light that's on why, the That's why I'm very effect. excited to talk about the Galaxy K Zoom, and we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm not counting the Galaxy S4 Zoom in this conversation. I'm not counting so, the Galaxy well, camera. Let's jump right into that anyway. We'll just skip over the. So, so just, just, just quickly telling you about the GS5. I think, look, the GS5, I much prefer the industrial design, this kind of more square squarish look that they reintroduced with the Note 3. Mm -hmm. I still think the Note 3 is a... Despite the fact that I don't like skeuomorphism, I do think this fake leather stitching thing it looks fits. still better than the dimpled back thing that they're yes. doing. Yes, but at it least, makes sense on the Note At too. least they've gone away from the hor horrendous shiny plastic crap. <laughs> thing no from, one is mourning hyperglaze From the GS3 <laughs> and GS4 and yeah. Note 1 and Note 2. And I mean, seriously, what the fuck, Samsung? Like, I, <laughs> no. And I can't, still can't fathom why they still make these things out of plastic. And, and I mean, because you, even when they, when they do plastic, they still do it wrong. Like HTC and Nokia have shown us how to do plastic. The mm -hmm. back cover on the Nokia X that costs $120 is still higher quality than the plastic cover on the GS5 for 
fuck's sake. Now, the GS5, though, I will say this for the for the material choice. Like, it's this, I don't know if it's actually glass weave or whatever like that, but it is, it, it's so much better than the hyperglaze than that it sort is. of fake hairline aluminum that I I will forgive the, the dimpled appearance I, for kind of being weird. It's just... But, but then, oh, but then you see, you know, this is how they ruin it. If you look at the, the again, look at the Note 3 if you have both of them in your hands. I do right now. So uh, look, look at them. The S5. Look I just send the Note but, 3 back. You know why? Because I broke it. <laughs> oh, but yeah. So the notes, see, see the fact it's water resistant, right? Which is yeah. really awesome, right? Yeah. But look, I think ra- doing water resistant like the Sony's been doing is way nicer because look, that ugly flap on the, on the connector at the bottom on the charge port. Right. Like it's ugly as sin. And it has this, huh. what I hate about the back cover of the GS5 and the, the Note 3 suffers from this, too, is that there is a bump where the headphone jack is. There is, yes. And there's a bump where the charger is because of the flap. Mm-hmm. To me, like, that's ugly. Why do you do that? Like, it, there's no reason for that to happen. Like, why not make this connector waterproof so you don't have to have a flap over it? Yeah, well, then that's the thing, because you can make the 35 millimeter. Uh, and and jack pick up your M8 for a second. Oh, yeah. Because I know you have one like I do. Totally. Okay, so yeah. pick up your mate and then pick up your GS5 and uh, position the headphones jack so that they kind of you can compare them. Mm-hmm. You see how smooth and the edge of the headphone jack is completely integrated in the edge of the M8. Absolutely. And, and the, you yeah, see that no bump, bump on the back cover. Why does that even exist? Yeah. Samsung. And this is this is the thing. You know, Samsung um, has been has been building phones for a very long time. They made the first smart uh, mobile phone I ever bought. And they they have a great they have a ton of experience. They have a ton of capability, and probably more industrial just capacity lazy. than any other manufacturer. So, right, is it that or is it just like well, we've seen it's that cost, you, it's cost, it's cost, it's cost. We, they... We've seen that you customers you will you will kind of eat up whatever we put out because we're going to market it really well and we're going to throw yeah. a lot of features so, into it. So, we look, don't really have to try. This is what Samsung this is why you should buy a Samsung phone because what they're telling you when you buy it that is that you're a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> but same time, and I have no tolerance you... for companies who tell me that you're I'm a, a sucker. sucker. <laughs> well, I want a company to tell me we're making the best product that we can for this price point for you, even if it means we're freaking suffering and struggling. No, I'm with you. I complete philosophically, I am completely with you. And but when I, I step out of things and I'm like, what are my priorities? All right, when I do get active sometimes, yes, I don't give a damn about the heart rate monitor i don't even care about that exactly but but the the ip67 in it's a great. device that's this Absolutely. portable i think is great and you but, know sony but sony's doing it right sony's doing it right and doing it much prettier i will say and that. samsung's doing it wrong and so, you know again uh, ui uh, interface software mm-hmm. you know if she sees doing it right samsung's oh, yeah. doing it yeah you know and that's my problem it's, and i have no problems with samsung per se like they I, that's what bugs me the most is i know they can make gorgeous devices yeah. look at the um what are they their their laptops the, the very thin oh, ultra books they make out of metal aluminum gorgeous. those yeah. things are insane why can't they make a phone like that even others i really I'd, like the nexus 10 oh so god I, yes oh the nexus yes. 10's a great nexus tablet 10? Exactly, yeah. and, uh, so, so, and I know I'm in the minority here, but I liked the Ative S. I think that was a well-made device, and it looked pretty good for being a variation of the S3. So, you want me to send that back to you? <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm <laughs> so, good. so the Note 3 to me is. I'm glad they've gone back to kind of the, the GS2 design, which is a bit squarer looking. And yeah, but yeah. with the with the GS5, my only thing is like I think I'm mean, a spec wise, this thing is a, is a monster. It's great. I mean, it's got everything you'd expect. But I don't see and it's and I have this criticism goes to HTC as well. I don't see as much of a step up this year, right? Like, sure. it's just an iteration, and I and I think the, like the 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 one plus one is is a is a step up. So we talked about and, the one plus one a lot last week, and I, I was wondering about that. You, now, you I, certainly that's a step up in terms of the price point and the uh, the hardware load, but in terms of industrial design, you find that you know, ah, it's very much appealing? better to me. This is it's very appealing. It's you touch just touch the plastic. It's like as I said, the Nokia X plastic is better than the GS five plastic. Sure. Yeah, and, not all and, plastic is created. And, and you know the 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 fifteen twenty unibody or the ten twenty unibody plastic is better than GS five plastic. The HTC One X in its day was yeah. a better. The, the Desire eight sixteen. Oh the, the Desire eight sixteen One X was the first phone I ever reviewed, and Have, I remember you, feeling that polycarbonate. Did you play with oh, the Desire eight sixteen at mobile? Yes, uh, not at and MWC, but it. It feels also, like yeah. it's a, it's the same as the HTC One X. It's like it mm-hmm. feels like the plastic feels like ceramic in your hand. Yes, exactly. That it feels good. like a, a, a chalkboard. I used to say. 
Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's what so I'm cool. talking about, Samsung. Why Samsung? can't you do that? I can guarantee you that plastic HTC One M8 that's coming out, that is rumored to come out. Oh, yeah, the oh, Ace or whatever that is. It's still going to blow away the GS5, I guarantee you, in quality of materials. In terms of fit and finish, yeah. What were you going to say, Taylor? Um, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that Samsung phones feel ins- insubstantial all the time, every single time. Now, I will tell you, I... I Agree with you largely, Taylor, yes. I disagree with you in one specific instance, which is handy for a segue, so I'll use it. <laughs> the, Galaxy, the Galaxy S4 Zoom was a, an oh. absolute weirdo to hold. It felt like talking it's on a terrible. camera. It was terrible. But it did feel substantial. And yes. my fundamental complaint about that device was that it was the most awkward thing ever to hold, except when you were shooting pictures. And it looks like maybe Samsung has solved that problem with the Galaxy K. So I'll tell you why I'm excited about the K Zoom. Tell me. Uh, okay, you know I'm a photographer, a photography buff, and I love taking phones with uh, cameras with uh, photos with my camera phones and cameras on my phones. Yeah. So you know Nokia obviously, and there's a company, there's a bunch of companies out there that are pushing the envelopes in terms of imaging. You know, obviously uh, Lytro is one, uh, mm-hmm. Nokia is another, because I believe that the future is is what I call software photography, which is basically you. You have basic, simple, high-quality hardware, like a good sensor and a good quality lens, but you do a lot of things like focusing, zoom, all that in software in, in a very smart and clever way that doesn't compromise quality. Sure. And, you know, the, the, the 808 PureView and then the 1020 have shown that that can be done for zooming. Now, uh, you know, Lytro is doing that for focusing. Um, and I think even uh, the refocus app for Lumias is a good example of of uh, uh, yeah, and, and you know the new of doing Google software camera as well. Yeah, Google camera as well. So and then uh, you know the HTC M8 is using a secondary sensor to do that, which I think is a little overkill. But the bottom yeah. line, this is all very interesting to me. But here's what I did last year: I took the 1020 and the Galaxy S4 Zoom with me to Burning Man as my main cameras. Whoa. Did they survive I, the dust? Of course, yeah, no problem. Huh. And I and I mean I kept them, you know, in a Ziploc bag when I wasn't using okay. them. I wiped them down when they were dusty. You used to take uh, the Moto phone with you to Burning Man, right? Well, I used the Moto phone. It's, I did it for <laughs> that review one time, just yeah. for fun, because it's the zombie apocalypse yeah, one. Exactly, as well. Exactly right, as we all know. Yeah. Uh, but but so here's my takeaway: like the the Lumia One in terms of daylight daylight usability for the fact that you can see the screen in daylight because it's got that kind of auto HDR mode on the screen. Oh yeah, it blasts right? up the brightness when you're. So you can in this super bright sunlight, you can still take a shot and frame it properly. Mm-hmm. Whereas the uh, the Z- GS4 Zoom, the, that Q, crappy QHD display would just get washed out, and I couldn't see what oh, I was right. composing. Right. Yeah. Now, but what I did notice is, and of course, when it came to zooming, you know having a 10 times zoom that maintains a full 16 megapixel shot, which is what the S4 zoom had, uh, is, is a better choice than having, uh, you know, only a three times zoom and a five megapixel output for the 1020. So I just, Granted. I just got the S4 zoom out of its box and I remember that. I, I remember like rotating right, in the ring right. and activating that zoom and the thing, you know, right. it's, it's lewd, but I, oh my God, it's incredible. Right. And so, so you'll ne- right now the, the, the optics, like this complicated mechanism of motors and lenses, it's still a better way to go for zooming ultimately. Sure. But here's what I found in low light at night when I could see the display on both, they were both very good. And and I would even say the Galaxy S4 Zoom had a bit of an edge in low light because it had optic. They both have optical image stabilization. The GS4 Zoom is a basically a point and shoot, so it can do actually a lot more optical image stabilization. And so the takeaway was that they're they're, they're both are doing like both stretching the limits of what you can do with a, a phone that has a built-in camera right. uh, or Just a camera that's a different phone. different means of getting uh, there. Exactly. And so the Samsung approach is kind of the traditional old school approach and, and the Nokia was the new software right. camera approach. But here's, here's ultimately what, what I felt one. Despite the fact that I couldn't see the GS4 zoom screen at times, it still won. And I tell you why. Because one night I tried to take a shoot, a shoot a shot of the full moon. Mm-hmm. And it was early in the evening, like 9 p.m. So it was still kind of low on the horizon. So, you know, it's bigger when it's lower on the horizon. And as sure. it rises, it gets smaller. And so in full manual mode on both cameras, I tried to take this shot. And ultimately, I 
the reason the S4 Zoom One was because of optical image stabilization combined with combined with a ten times optical zoom, and the fact that I can then crop the resulting sixteen megapixel picture into something still usable. So I have this photo of the moon where you can see the craters. With that the, took taken with hand, the S4 that zoom. took handheld with the GS4 <laughs> Zoom. It's a long exposure and everything. No, and I did I, the same with the 1020. And it's, it looks good on the 1020, except that the resulting picture is literally 10 side by 10 by pixels. Side. Exactly. Side by side. It's not Because I can't because zoom in onto that 5. I can't crop that 5 megapixel shot. And I only have a 3 times zoom to start with. Right. Yeah. And I, I stood across. I was at a, a, a bus stop once with the S4 zoom when I was spending some time with it. And I was across the street and down the road from a subway on the corner, a, a, you know, a sandwich shop. And I just cranked up the zoom as far as it would go. It was nighttime, and I was looking on the phone. I was looking through the window of this subway that's probably 500 feet away, and like reading the the nutrition facts on the back of a bag of Doritos. I mean, it's, you know, it's just <laughs> nuts. So, having did you have a little mic stand problem there? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> What's <laughs> happened? No, you, you all right over there, Joe? I was trying to mute while I was setting up this Galaxy S5 because I just remembered that oh, one arrived in my office, and I haven't got a chance to play with one until you about that. now. So, so you have one right now. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm, I'm trying to make it through the menu, so I was going to mute so you don't hear bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> Which is the most annoying thing in the world. So the thing is, the, the S4 excites me in, in that way that only a phone that arrives and, and uh, brings with it a lot of low expectations and then surprises you can excite you. Because I, I have a, a very, very warm place in my heart for it as a result of its excellent photo performance, despite it being the world's most awkward thing. And to see the Galaxy K look a lot more ergonomic. Yeah, and the bigger, me. better screen, I hope, for the daylight yes, visibility. Yes, 4.8 my... inch Super AMOLED. And it's got an interesting processor set up, right? Like it's, it looks yeah, like some kind it? of Exynos like with six cores. Yeah, it's a 1.3 uh, gigahertz quad core and then a 1.7 gigahertz dual core. It looks like that's crazy talk. Yeah, but they're not talking about bringing this to the states, which is crazy because this is the kind of thing you you would think that AT and T would so jump on. Here's a link to that moon photo that I took with the GS4 Zoom last year. Oh man! And and watch me. and and cry because it'll be <laughs> it'll be amazing. I don't know if it lets me. I don't know if it'll let you see. Let me see if I can give you the 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 associated post with it because it might not. Oh, there's Google. All right, so I've got. Wow, that God, that's a gorgeous shot of the moon. You can actually handheld man. I can't, this is with the it, S4 and so just to be clear, this is only a 640 by 480 crop of what I got on the viewfinder. I'm saving this and putting it in the show notes, viewers. So if you want and to then, see this, um, you can see it. By the way, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a G plus link to actually I'm going to give you a Flickr link to my Burning Man picture so people can compare the two phones themselves because I took a lot of the same shots. Sweet. So that way yeah, you can drop see. In the chat. Uh, I'll do it. I think uh, we should. We're, I want to be mindful of time a little bit because we're. You know, uh, I think I think I can stick around. It's fine. Stick around for a second. Okay. Yeah. I I wanted. I do want to eventually get to uh, talk about this this Android Silver thing because this is important. Thank you. I've got the link there. Um, do you uh, do you have a, a closing thought? Are you going to get your hands on this on this K? Because it seems like so it's, you, should, you should spend get, some time with it. Right. The K is hard to get. Uh, I mean, I was able to get the GS4 Zoom last year through uh, Samsung PR US because I was at Engadget, you know, and they right. they went and dug one out for me in Korea and pushed some buttons and made it happen. It's going to be a little harder now that I don't have quite the clout that I did uh, last year. You know, uh, it took a while for me to get a GS5 this year. Uh, uh, I but, think it took a while for everybody to get a GS5. Yeah. So, yeah. so here's what I think. I'm I'm going to request it, obviously. Um, I'm sure uh, our wonderful friends at Samsung US, who are awesome, will try their best to get me one. But if I don't, I might uh, see if uh, Ryan and the Negri crew can uh, lend me one for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, I don't think I'll be able to necessarily, since it's not planned to be a US device, it's harder to get uh, a review unit. I still find it difficult to believe that AT&T is not going to say, hey, let us let us." Well, it this. will eventually, right? But, yeah. I mean, I'd like to get my hands on it uh, a little sooner. Sooner than that. Yeah, no, I agree. I also asked about the uh, the Galaxy Beam when I was talking to Samsung. The Beam 2, have you seen that? Oh, the Beam 2, yeah. I played. I had the Beam 1 for a while to you play did? with. I still oh, haven't yeah. played with a projector phone. It's I really to... cool. I would, like, I, would be in, uh, I would lie in my bed and project on the ceiling and oh. watch movies. Oh, see, that's cool. <laughs> but it was like a dim projector. The battery though, lasted right? like half an hour. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> You could watch one episode of Friends and then you were done. That's right. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, let's talk about this this whole overarching kind of change in the uh, in Google's Nexus line that that Android Silver maybe represents. This is some of the more interesting speculation I've seen, and I don't know exactly how I feel about it. The uh, rumors, listeners, if you are not familiar, is uh, are that the Google is fostering this program called Android Silver, which would focus on sort of higher end Android devices to replace the Nexus family. Silver models will be first in line for platform updates, premium high-end hardware, and Google would bring five handsets into the program at any given time, Ooh. according to all these rumors, right? And also, Google would throw a bunch of resources at promoting that lineup, uh, including carriers and retailers and, and so on. And uh, all this is sort of rumored for 2015. So this sounds quite interesting. And it, yeah, from our perspective, it's sort of exciting. It's like, oh, yeah, cool. High-end hardware pushed by Google. Awesome. But that sounds to me like we would be sacrificing one of the important elements of the Nexus program that has always been the case, which is low price, you know, low cost handsets. Yeah. So well, high high end doesn't necessarily mean low price. Though. I mean, high price, though. I mean, the one plus one is an example of that. That's a good point. Um, yeah, um, I just I do want to say that this kind of reminds me of a BGR rumor. That they they sent out, I guess, in like 2011 or 2012, saying that there would be five Nexus phones in 2013 or the following you know, year. I'm kind of happy with just having one Nexus phone a year. I am too. And I'll tell yeah. you why, because even though it does age, right? Obviously, so far they've all aged very gracefully. And you know, I have a Nexus Five as my main phone. I wouldn't want it any other way. The reason I have a Nexus Five as my main phone because for the money, it's the best thing you can get. I mean, arguably now the the one plus one might be the best thing you can get, but it still hasn't doesn't have OIS, which I believe is a pretty critical part of the camera experience. Yeah, I agree which is you. vexing me on the M8 because the M7 had it, and it's not <laughs> vexing me that I have an Nexus Five that has OIS in my pocket every day, and that it's you know a Snapdragon 800 device that's still up to date with still one of the highest resolution screen, full LTE support for the US, mm -hmm. and costs nothing. Yeah, no, it's true, and I've so. I want one a year like that. I want that to continue. I, I want to see, you know, a G3, uh, LG G3 based Nexus 6 next year. Do you? Or you, you want it from LG again? Uh, you know what? Because I think LG manages to find the sweet. I, and that's why I love the G2. And, and I think because it's a sweet, even though like it's not as well made as, you know, it's more like a, a Samsung in terms of materials. It's not as crappy for one thing. But what, it's... G2? um. Yeah, it's uh, much better than it's a, you know. It's, I never. I caught a lot of heat. Look at the fit. Look at the look at look at the fit and finish. Look at the fit and finish I compared know, to the Samsung. Next, next to the S4, I think the G2 is one and the same. I really do. I think that plastic feels just as gummy and nasty. It does feel it nasty, but slight. I think it's it's better manufactured. Mm. It, you know, those the seams are tighter. There is no there's no mold marks at the corners of the phone like on the GS4 and GS3. Well, the GS3 had it really bad. And I, thought, the, I think the 4 fixed those, though. I really think the 4 looked I pretty see good. it on it's the Note 3 right in front of me. You can see the mold lines again on each corners of the silver ring. You see right. the mold line from the mold. The I mean, too, you have who that does that? Soap dish construction where it comes around to the front, then you have that sharp edge uh, at, at the sides, and I really didn't like that. I, you know, I thought it, that was, all I know it has rear-facing buttons, which I just I don't mind those buttons. To. I think those buttons I are I like fun. the buttons. They're cool. Yeah. I think they're But no, all I'm trying to say is that is that. I actually think in terms of build quality and materials, the Nexus 5 is better than the G2. Oh, I agree. But the, jet, the G2 is better in specs. So what I'm trying to say, what the reason I think LG is a good partner for Google, that's how this conversation started, right? So the reason yeah. that is, is because they have a right, the right balance of, you know, pretty decent design and build quality generally, especially for the Nexus devices. And mm -hmm. at the same time, they have uh, pretty, really good hardware. And the software is... Generally crappy on the LGs, but guess what? That's why you have a Nexus. Yeah, I just it, with with the alternatives out there, it's hard for me to get excited about this. Continuing you couldn't LG get an because... HTC One M8 as a Nexus without spending seven hundred dollars. It's called the GPE version, right? Oh, no, that's true too. But but then all right, so I know because HTC is sort of the go-to area where you want to, if you want to like kind of fanboy out about. I mean, like, I had an HTC. Look, about... I've had, I had a Nexus One, then I had yeah. a Nexus S, and I had a Nexus a Galaxy Nexus, and a Nexus Four, Nexus Five. So I've had, had a whole lot. Yeah. I've, I, every year I buy one, right. and so. The end result is this, is that the Nexus One was awesome. And I was really bummed when because it was HTC and it was made beautifully, but it was Gorgeous. expensive. It then was the Galaxy yeah. S was made like crap and it was expensive. No, no, you mean the Nexus S? 
Sorry, the yeah. Nexus. And the Nexus has, and what, the it was Galaxy gorgeous Nexus. to look at, though. I'm I'm sorry, the Nexus has got too much crap because it was, it was so slime pretty. Plastic. It, we, it yeah, was we, pretty. We picked it up. It was, it was pretty, nasty. but it felt like. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's yes. terrible. Yeah. It creaked in your hand, yeah. and then the Galaxy Nexus was even worse. That was the first Nexus I ever owned. I bought that when I went to Verizon, and I had the Verizon one, which was oh, the no, worst of the all. Oh no, that's the fake Nexus. Yeah, the fake. That's the yeah, fake yeah. I think I wrote a piece. It was like that. This ain't no Nexus phone. It was one of my no first Nexus. editorials. So, yeah. so the, the fake Nexus or the the Galaxy Nexus uh, were, I think, even worse. So and then yeah, the Samsung experiment didn't work out. Then, then they went, then they went to LG, and how much better was it with that that you know the G, the the Optimus G based Nexus Four. There's the Nexus Four was 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 built quality materials. Well regarded, way yes. Yeah. No, I I agree. You're you're and right. That's what I'm just, saying. So I just me, can't help but think of a Motorola Nexus phone. I know it's a little bit of a weird territory there, but we already have it. It's called the Moto G. Mm, <laughs> yeah. But you gotta believe that it would have. Come on, the Moto X. I really, the Nexus. I, I never, you know, I was never a fan of the Moto X. Too I'm expensive. A giant fan not, of the Moto X. No, too expensive compared to the competition at the time. It was too expensive and too low spec. No, uh, it's a spec. See, that, that's the thing. I mean, and, if, and if the you're gimmicks use don't a device, do it for me. Those really? gimmicks don't do it. It's not because it's not a pure the way Nexus. I use my phone. The, not a pure Nexus device. I, 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 think, I don't care. I've really. See, don't get updates. I don't care. It, do, it does get updates. It, well, it does updates get updates pretty quickly. quickly. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah, as fast as Nexus. Not oh. as fast as GPU. Yeah, no, you've got to wait a couple more days. You're talking sure, about Nexus. But... You're not talking about the best phones in summer 2013. We're talking about the Nexus. <laughs> right. No, all I'm saying is that it's tough for me to get to get super amped on this continuing LG kind of track with the Nexus without thinking of it. When I can think of like, oh, man, what if it would be great if we had a, a Nexusified Moto X or some middle ground between the X and the G. With yeah, say, okay, with a Snap 801 or whatever, you know, with, with, with something extremely cool like that. Because I'm a fit and finish kind of person, and honestly, yes, the Nexus Five is better than the G2, but it still never really did it for me. It still feels like a phone that yes, you it does a lot, but you paid, you know, what whatever, two ninety nine for it. You know, where yeah. it's like the Moto X feels a little bit to me like a phone that wow, wow, this is really engineered well. I feel like I could. Take this it feels to a great. dinner party and fit in, but this also is, drop it off. There's only one thing I like about the Moto X. It feels great in hand. That's the only thing I like. The yeah, camera is like shit. The, dimple, right? the software is gimmicky. The, the price gimmicky. is too high. The specs are too low. The screen is meh. Like, seriously, like I don't understand why the big hype with the Moto X. However, the Moto G, oh, yeah. Did oh, you, yeah. How much time did you spend with the Moto X, though? Lots. I've got two of them. Really? I've got a Ryzen model in white, and I've got a customized made one, h t one. You know how we all got to make our own, remember? Somewhat, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Just, oh, wait, we had the Moto 137. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, somebody out there in the comments, probably about 40 million actually, are saying, thank God, because I think every time we've ever had anyone on the podcast, they've, we've all been of the same note on the Moto X, which is like, oh, my God, it's the most amazing thing ever. So it's thank not. you for I've, shaking it up. Oh, it's I've, a foot. To me, it's a footnote of 2013. To the me, significant it's, it's phones of 2013. Of, the of, number of, one phone of, of 2013. <laughs> to me, the number one phone of 2013 was the HTC One. Of the number what the, the M7, yeah. yeah, and then the the second one for the second half was the Nexus Five. No, no contest. Nothing could touch the Nexus Five today. Very few phones can still touch the Nexus Five. Yeah, if you, if you're if you're looking at the spec sheet, but I mean, I just think that the day to day well, performance no, just look of at the, the Moto software. X. That's what I'm saying. I think the day to day performance of the Moto X to me it's slower a, than my Nexus. Maybe maybe slower by a hair on the on the taps and such. But did the added utility that I get from things like touchless control from Moto Assist when I'm driving? I mean, it's just a much more friendly device to me. It integrates itself into my life better than the Nexus does. Yeah. I can see that. I I was actually hoping that these gimmicky. Well, not the only thing that's gimmicky is the, um, what's it called the, the mode where it shows you like notifications if you just like tap the phone or whatever. What, the active display. Yeah, I, like I don't care about that. What I care the most about is the OK Moto Now, okay, whatever Google, it is. The, uh, okay, okay, Google, Google, Google Now. Yeah. Okay, Google That's now. what I say when I have to go find I was, my phone. I, I was hoping. I was hoping that they would do this on the Nexus, actually. And there's yeah. no reason they could do this. And, you don't need well, a separate coprocessor for that. There's rumors that OK Google Everywhere is going to bring that to uh, to some other devices. And yeah, this, this, it's built into the Snapdragon 800 anyway. I, so there I you love go. the Capability. trusted device feature, though. That's something that I miss on every other phone that I use. Trusted after devices. The motorway. Yeah, because I can have a pin lock, and if I'm connected to my Pebble, it's it's locked. Right. It's password protected. If it disconnects, it will lock, and I, I can't get into it without a pin. Mm-hmm. Um, I miss that. Uh, there are some apps that kind of mimic that, but they're not as, as nice. But I did love Active Display. 
Yeah. That's something I also miss. Like, I pick up my phone and the display kind of just kind of turns Come, on and I can see if I need life. something and yeah. I can put it down if I don't have anything. So, I mean... Well, this is why I like the M8 because you just double tap on the display and it turns on. Yeah. I mean, I, I do enjoy that. And, the G2 and, does the double tap. Nokia has been doing the double tap since the Symbian days. Yeah. G2 does the like double a, tap. It's not like a and tap it works thing. Like 40% it's like, of it's the, like time. The, the Moto X knows that it's in a pocket, so it doesn't turn the. But when it comes out of the pocket, it knows that it's in a pocket. Do you know that every so like, HTC oh, here, phone. Do you know that HTC. Every HTC phone since the sensation has a pocket detection mode? It's in the settings. Yeah, but it doesn't do It's not the same thing. It does not do it the, as well as consistently, and the end result is just not as smooth. It's really. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a subtle difference. Yes, but it it really is. I I guess I just never enjoyed the value add that these things brought to me. Basically, I just I just didn't notice them. I sure. didn't use them, and so to me, it's, it's and then it was like, look at the specs, look at the price, and it's not an Nexus, not interesting. <laughs> right. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. You know, and that's the thing. Like honestly, being a Nexus for me is, and this is why the silver stuff is interesting because I kind of have a hard time swallowing. It. And and again, this is why I'm bringing back LG too because LG has proven two years in a row now that they can make an affordable, high quality piece of hardware. Regardless Regardless of the software, Can't just and so, that. Yep. and then on top of that, Google's putting the best software they can, and and and, and to me, getting better all the time. Yeah, and to so. me, that's 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 you know the reason I have a Nexus is because it's just the smoothest, most like to me, it's always the best software experience on Android. And Even me, the M8 is with with Sense Six, which is probably the best skin there is out there today. Yeah. Is is still not quite as nice to me as my Nexus. Now, what about the M8 Google Play Edition? Well, so the Google, of course, it's you know, it's a Google. The Google Play Editions to me are basically the same as as an X. I feel the same when I use my M8 or my M7 Google Play Edition, or even my Galaxy S4 Google Play Edition. Yeah, I feel like the Google Play Edition is the the, the wet dream of of, of phone the, geeks. The thing is, though, this year amazing. I'm feeling a little different. I'm feeling a bit different already. Last year. When with the M7, I would recommend the Google Play Edition over the Sense version. Mm -hmm. But this year, I feel that the Sense has gotten so good, so lightweight, and and the value add of all the functionality is so good that, and the Nexus 5 in parallel to that is so good mm -hmm. that I don't really see the reason for me to go to a Google Play Edition M8 for 700. I'd rather use the Sense 6 version, frankly, because I actually feel like it's a better seamless integration between the hardware and the software. I agree, and I think uh, I think I was I would have said the same thing last year, and I think I did about the M7 actually, because I liked Blink Feed as it was in excuse me Sense as it was in version five even, and then five point okay. five. But so I agree, but I think for for people who really value the Nexus experience like me. But don't necessarily like the Nexus hardware. Hardware, yeah. Again, See, I like, like the me, Nexus like... hardware. That's the thing. Like, I, I feel that even though it's plasticky, yeah. I like the square shape. I like the thinness. I like this uh, soft touch. I have a black one, so the, I prefer oh, so the, 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 the soft touch one. finish. Yeah, yeah. Well, the but, soft touch finish on it. Like, a lot of people are like it. I mean, I think a lot of and, people are in the same boat as you. But, but the and the other thing is the OIS. Like they removed the OIS from the M8. That instantly makes it a huge frustrated the hell out of me. So frustrating. I know, and I'm a big OIS fan as well. But the thing thing is the google play edition was there for people like me who are like okay yeah it's an excess cool but i don't really like the hardware oh cool i can get the google experience on a piece of hardware that i really like and yeah i gotta pay more but oh i can get it that's great and i'm a little sad that the, the way the rumors are going anyway it, it looks like the google play edition might you know cool. go by the wayside if this android silver thing comes to pass as it as it might but you know we have a whole nother year to, we'll to see, worry right? about this. We will see. I just wanted to touch on it because it was sort of the biggest news of the week in terms of Android rumors. So it was important mm -hmm. to discuss it. And while you were talking, uh, since you mentioned rather Motorola and LG, let's just tell everybody what's going on. Are you going, are you going to the San Francisco one for Motorola? Uh, no, I, I haven't been invited. You're so. busy. I, 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 should, I, should, I should be able to go if I'm invited. I, I don't yeah. know. Are they having an event soon then? Yes. Motorola and LG are each having an event. Let's see. LG. Uh, LG is going to have something. They're going to launch a, G, a G3, I'm the, sure. G3. That's what it's going to be. It's uh, the, To be simple is to be great, says the Wal Ralph Waldo Emerson quote uh, in the invitation. That's May 27th, so that's going to be the G3 almost certainly. We will be there. I think they're having the San Francisco one and, the, and a New York one and a London one, I believe. So stay tuned for that. And then there's also the Motorola event, which is happening first. That's Tuesday, May 13th. Uh, but this one doesn't seem – this seems to be a, a hint of something else entirely. This Is Is a, that the Moto one? Yes, yeah, the Motorola, the, the affordable one. It's the um, – Could be the Moto E. 
It could be. Uh, flexibility with pricing, confident two weeks. Sorry, I didn't have the note handy when I clicked on the thing, so let me just see what the invitation actually says. This is a new class of Motorola smartphone, says the thing. And there's something about, yeah. Now we would like to invite you to experience a new class of smartphone designed to make a great mobile internet experience accessible to everyone. I do not know what that means, but I'm excited to find out what it means. So yeah, once again, that's May 13th, and uh, it'll be interesting. We're going to have a whole lot to talk about. I keep telling people in my life, Miriam, and you've probably Mm -hmm. had events like this, that, um, you know, I really miss you, and I'm going to see you again when it finally stops being busy. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Um, So, you know, the other thing, when was was the... um when was the the Moto event? You said the twenty second. Uh, no, the LG event is the twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Yeah, the Motorola event is on the thirteenth. Ah, thirteenth. Yeah, and that actually. Have you seen SF? So, so that that one is in London, but there's a uh-huh. co- there's an event that's happening uh, commensurately with that in um, New York. Oh, cool! Yeah. yeah. No, I generally, I mean, if it's an SF, I'll try to go. Um, the LG I, one is an SF. I tend to ping the PR folks on a regular basis. I figure if they don't invite me, it's primarily because they don't have space. Like, sure. for example, the uh, HTC One event. Uh, they invite. They actually invited me to that, but I couldn't really make New York. So. Oh yeah, I was going to say no. I didn't see that. Um, sweet. Well, we we touched on the One Plus before. Taylor stepped out for a second. Taylor, are you back yet? I am. Hey! Yay! Welcome <laughs> I've been I've been drinking too much water lately. Oh, tell me about it. I've like, been drinking too much coffee recently. Like 200 fluid ounces a day. <laughs> so much water. Let's uh let's wrap up our our photographic discussion before we hop into listener mail with uh, a brief kind of bone throw at iOS. There was almost no Windows Phone news this week of note, and iOS, well, a couple things happened. The only thing germane to our discussion at the moment is this rumor of a um an iPhone 6 camera with bigger pixels and something called electronic image stabilization. And I hope that one of you knows what that is. <laughs> well, it's just not optical. It's like basically uh, what the 808 PeerView does when it records video, where it has a 1080p window that's floating around that 41 megapixel sensor. Oh. <laughs> and it just, yeah. you know. So what I'm thinking <laughs> is this. Uh, seeing bigger pixels means, you know, that... Uh, I mean, iOS, uh, sorry, Apple's, if, that, if they're doing that, is validating everything HTC's done with ultra pixels, right? Yes. I mean, I honestly think ultra pixels are awesome. I just wish I could see more of them. Yes. So to me, yeah. I, w- I want to see, an, I, I don't want to see the pixels get smaller or maybe just marginally smaller, 1.7 micron versus two, like the iPhone 5S is at 1.5 micron. So, you know, something around the 1.7, 1.8 micron per pixel would be great. But eight megapixels, you don't need more than that for the final output. What? What does matter, though, is if you're going to do electronic image stabilization, perhaps the way they're going to implement is is use an 8 megapixel um, array that only produces 5 megapixel shots at the end. And so they have a bit of a margin around the sensor to, in software, correct for motion. You know what I'm saying? Pixel doubling uh, yeah. action there. Yeah. And, 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 you know, if you look at what Apple's doing right now, I mean... I, I think OIS is is kind of a stopgap. Ultimately, we want to once we can do it in software, we'll be able to do it in software much better, much faster. But OIS right now is necessary because it's really hard to do uh, uh, this kind of algorithm of a floating window inside of a sensor. And Apple's doing some pretty cool stuff there, and I wouldn't be surprised if they can implement something very clever. So that's you know, interesting because I was always so amped on OIS, I, and, and not just because of the results. I was amped on OIS from a very geeky perspective. I love the notion of... Of these uh, little sense motor, motors, like, like Yeah, like, like these piezoelectric moving. things moving things around on ball bearings and a camera housing like floating around within a within its own cradle and stuff. I, I think as hardware is, more, is marginalized more and more by increasingly capable software, we get, you know, things just kind of get less interesting from a nerdy perspective for me, you know. Yeah, I, for I'm, sure. No, I mean, it's, but the thing is, it's much more reliable to make it electronically, right? I mean, uh, all these complicated sensors and motors and, tri- you know, um, actuators. Points just, of failure, right? Points of failure and points where dust can get in potentially. And right. I mean, so the the thing is, I think that uh, what Apple's doing today with the iPhone 5S is really interesting. The, the ISP takes several pictures in a row when you take a picture and uh, rebuilds a shot from the multiple picture, you picking the parts of the picture that are the least blurry 
Interesting. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how they do that. that's how they do stabilization yeah. in low light. And it's very clever. So imagine a larger sensor where you can do the same thing with larger pixels, but then now imagine the ability to maybe output a, like like Puru does a, a down sample picture, a still high enough quality high enough resolution, five megapixels or whatever, and then take advantage of having a bunch of extra pixels on the edge so you can do the the image stabilization electronically. Uh, if done right in terms of software, this should work just as well as OIS. I was going to say, and one of the principal things that OIS contributed that I found valuable was was low light improvement because you know it can yeah. hold the Absolutely. thing steady for a long exposure. And I still take a lot of low light shots. And Me too. I, I, the biggest problem though is that you you and I, when we think low light shots, like we're willing to. You know, we're, we're, cap we're trying to capture things that are not necessarily moving very fast sure. uh, in low light. And so I think the problem is that, like, you know, I, I'm kind of play, playing devil's advocate against OIS in a way here. But don't get me wrong. I, I, the problem is, like, electronic stabilization up to now hasn't really been done right, except for maybe, like, the 808 peer review for video and a yeah. few others. Like, it's like what, on the what, S5, what, it's just on the, Exactly. What, yeah. I've, what, the, what, uh, what um, Apple's been doing with the 5S is interesting, too. Oh, yeah. But what I'm saying is that that's why we have Nokia said, screw it. Let's do OIS. And then, you know, um, the big the, – the, then HTC did with the 1M7, and then G, obviously uh, LG has been doing it pretty actively oh, with almost the every G2, one of their phones. Uh, the G2, the, cool. the, the, the G Pro 2, the, uh, the Nexus 5, etc. But I think you're going to see in a year or two, they'll, it'll be gone. OIS. It'll be replaced by much more advanced, again, software photography alg algorithms yeah. that do the same thing. And I think that's kind of where Apple's trying to go. And I wouldn't be surprised if other companies follow suit because if it's if it's done right, it should theoretically be even better than Oppo. what we could do with Oppo. Yeah, exactly. There, it's a perfect example because when I when I saw or read what they were going to do with the Find Seven and Find Seven A, I thought that sounds stupid and that's going to be the worst gimmick ever. And now that I have the Find Seven A and I've used it and taken pictures at thirteen and fifty megapixel images or, or resolution. The 50 megapixel images look better, and not just not just at 50 megapixels. If you shoot at 50 megapixels and then downsample to 13, yeah, so it looks it, much better than the it's 13. Again, it's it's software photography, and that's what yep. I'm, I'm getting to. Work. We're going to get to a point where this stuff is going to work, and throwing faster uh, C, uh, I, um, SOCs and ISPs at this problem will make it better. Uh, so I think it's interesting to see that. I mean, there's some validity in I can I can see Apple choosing to completely bypass OIS and and trying to find other ways like EIS, electronic image stabilization, to do it. And I think we'll get to that eventually. But today, OIS is the way to go. But it's bad for motion, right? So you know when you OIS typically because it now stabilizes the image continuously, it lets you open the shutter longer, which is great. Right. But when you open the shutter longer, you get blur if somebody's moving. Almost And think yeah. of the average user of phones. And this is why I think the iPhone 5S is still the best camera phone for the average user. Mm -hmm. Because they don't think and they don't worry about the f f uh, taking pictures in terms of what a photographer would want to do, like somebody who is an an avid, uh, passionate, like a tripod uh, hobbyist photographer, photo photographer yeah. like you and I would be. Like they don't think about that. They don't care about the fact that yes, you can open the shutter for a long time and have a handheld shot that's uh, stabilized by an optical image system. Um, they are concerned with a person wanting to take a selfie in a club. While dancing, <laughs> right? That's what they're concerned that's with because that's targeting. the average user is asking, exactly. and so and so that is almost impossible to do with OIS, yep. and and so that's I, so you know I'm playing devil's advocate, but on the other hand, ultimately it's about satisfying the requirements of the average person who doesn't give a crap about the technology behind the and camera. I think that was a very crafty move on Nokia's part, who you know probably did not have the software you know ability to to craft that that kind of software that we're talking about on the excuse me, that stabilization on the software side. And so they're like, wait, hold on. We can make this amazing OIS rig and we can position this device as the professional's choice. Right. If if there is a you know such a person, a professional photographer who's like, I prefer my smartphone. You know, no, but <laughs> we can sort of invent this category, right? And push the 1020 and the 808 Pureview before it. And, you know, it worked from a from a buzz perspective. 
I don't know if it worked from a numeric perspective, but it was it was interesting to see that happen. Certainly, I was very excited for the 1020 as it was leading up to its announcement. When I bought one, I've I've been very happy with mine. I just I mean, for the kind of photography I do, OIS right now is a major payoff for me. What kind of photography? Uh, but do you I, do? I I understand. Well, I mean, you know, like generally when I do night shots, it's not people that are moving. And if anything, yeah. there is moving in the shot. I actually want to have to have the streaks of light. Like That's you know, so much that, fun to do traffic. That picture and, I recently, yeah. yeah, exactly. The picture of traffic streaks uh, and stuff. That's so much fun. Yeah, but I that's, love that. You know, I love having manual person, control over stuff. No, the average of course, person, yeah, person doesn't, doesn't do that. Doesn't they don't no. care. In fact, they think that's a bad picture. Well, <laughs> that's what's nice when you can show the very best of what the camera can do and people are like, oh, wow, I want that. And I think actually I think those are the most interesting consumers that I can think of. And I don't know if they're all imaginary. Maybe I'm just making them up. But I made this point in my review, like the 1020 makes me want to be a better photographer. It doesn't. It frustrates because, me to it. You know, degree, because it makes it's, me it's be about better. photography as an art, and this is a big difference. Is like yeah. I've always approached my camera phone since the first one that I bought, which was the Sony Ericsson uh, K fifty seven fifty i, which is the first autofocus phone in the world, two megapixel autofocus, and goddamn it, thing took good pictures. <laughs> very slow though, very slow. Uh -huh. But the thing is, the thing is, to me, it's always been about thinking about my shot, composing my shot, getting something interesting out of it. The art of photography. The average person doesn't care about that. Yeah. So here's what you have to do. So Nokia is kind of addressing the art of photography. Apple is addressing the selfie everyday person. Not, uh, if you look at what Samsung and HTC are doing, HTC is trying to do both. And HTC is doing it well with the front-facing camera. They're doing, as well. I mean, they're that, doing pretty, they're doing nice. pretty well. Samsung's kind of more on the the, uh, the Apple way. Like they just want yeah. people to be able to take solid pictures no matter what. And until recently, but, they offered a viewfinder that was very simple to operate, and it was cool. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I think what's interesting to me is that in, in an ideal world, what I want to do, and I, I've talked to HTC about this, is I want every phone there is out there that have a have a camera that when you turn it on, acts like an iPhone camera just takes the best possible picture for the best uh, widest range of scenarios is really smart it's completely automated and just nails it every time and i think apple has that down pat but i want all phones to do that and what i also want to do see is at the same time as setting in the menus that's the advanced mode Sure. And so the advanced the mode, of what, and what I wanted to see. Has. I want to see this on the iPhone too, because I know that their sensor and optics are good enough to give us a pretty awesome advanced mode. Sure. So the advanced mode gives you manual controls. You know what I want? I would want manual focus and manual exposure. Uh, excuse manual me, manual focus, uh, shutter speed. Shutter speed. Yeah. Those are the two. I agree. Focus yeah. and shutter speed, and then for you know for the phones like the S4 Zoom that actually have variable aperture, variable aperture, because then you can play with depth of field, yeah. which is really fun, right? See, that's, two, see, that's you're getting into territory that I have yet to explore. There's two <laughs> aperture setting on the S4 Zoom, which is really cool. And the K will probably have at least two uh, two aperture sizes too. Uh, the 808 PureView has two aperture sizes as well. Yeah, uh, they removed that on the 1020. You know, the 808 PureView is a better camera than the 1020. Oh, I know. We, lacks, did, we did a lot of side-by-side side on that. It, it lacks was, OIS, but it's you, better. The comment, I have never seen the comments get more brutal than, than 808 <laughs> yeah. fanboys against 1020 fanboys. I just couldn't, oh, I couldn't we're believe talking it. About, we're talking about how great the 1020 camera is, and all the comments are, the 808's better. The 808's better. <laughs> yeah. Here's some samples. The 808's better. It's like, yeah, we know that, but the 1020 is still great. It was great. a really the 808's better. thing. Oh, yeah, by I the mean, way. Uh, 808 in no light, though, doesn't have OIS, and it sucks because of it. Right. Uh, break, so I, breaking news. Uh, IFA registration is open. <laughs> Yeah, if I have if I time. Um, if I is always happening while I'm at Burning Man, so I always miss it. Uh, um, it's fun. That's okay. Um, so anyway, to summarize, yeah. because I know you want to move on, yeah. uh, what I'm going to say is that I want to see all manufacturers provide us with some kind of manual mode. And I think what I've liked with the M8 was that they added this ob option to save presets. Yeah. You know, you oh, can yes. change a camera. Like I have one for HDR, one for regular panorama, one for manual mode, where it puts more directly into manual mode. Uh -huh. um, and and this, this, those are the only three presets that I really need. If you're not going to give me presets, I can save myself. Um, and and if they do that, I think we're we're going to be set. And and I think you're going to see that. You know, uh, for cameras that have OIS, uh, I can actually see almost OIS almost being disabled. Or, or use very sparingly for the average person because it adds motion blur, right? 
because you tend sure. to want to keep the shutter open longer. But but then it's turned on more and and more available on for people who want long shutter shots um, that are kind trying to do artistic photography. You know, I, I have a, I have a question very specifically, which I just was reminded of as I fired up this M8 camera. What is the deal? Do you think? With HTC's cameras having that very, very distinctive sensitivity where they swing wildly in exposure based on uh, based on the light level. Like, you know what I'm talking about? You're trying to set up a shot and you're like, well, okay. So here's the problem. The, the, sensor, the sensor on the M7 M8 is very – it has poor dynamic range. So getting the exposure – adjusting the exposure and getting it right is, is very critical because otherwise you're going to get a lot of overblown and, or really dark areas. And so, it's, yeah. so they, have to, they have to do a lot more uh, adjustments on exposure than the average phone. And then the other thing is I actually honestly think there's a bunch of bugs in their exposure. I find the HDR is always overexposed. Oh, yeah. You've got some halos um, around stuff sometimes. It's just yeah. – you know, there's a bunch of issues – uh, that I hope they're going to fix in the next revision of the firmware. Uh, While well, the app, since they're launching, is that's the cool part, right? All the uh, all the new functionality on the M8 is updatable through the, the Play Store, which is right. really cool. Yeah, it is. Um, so I mean, I mean, I think I think there is it's it's a bit of a combination of limitations of the sensor combined with some bugs and I some love... things that need to be fixed. It's so funny to to see uh, that that manufacturers still have sort of personalities that are reflected in the output of their cameras. We started a series, Miriam, a few... Oh, it's about time for another one, actually. A few months ago, we started a series called Guess What uh, Guess What Smartphone Took These Photos. We <laughs> post nice. a bunch of photos, strip all the EXIF data, and reduce them to a, 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 the same resolution. And, you know, no one ever gets anything right. The, 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 <sighs> the guess rate is something like 5% correct or 7% correct. And it, it's. It, I wonder if we're at finally at a point where... Everything well, is think, so good, even the crap. And it's my favorite thing to do is take shots with a really crappy camera phone and then have people be like, oh, that's a Lumia 920. It's like, no, that was the Moto X. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I blow you know? people's minds all the time. I think this is, again, the thing. Like, to me, one of my passions about photography is it doesn't matter what camera I'm given. Mm. Give me an old Logitech VGA webcam <laughs> and I'll make some good photos with it. Yeah, like, I used to take some great shots with the Sanyo dumb phones in, like, 2004. Yeah. I think people... People forget that, you know, it's, photography is not about the tool you're using. Obviously, yes, it is. I mean, I, I want to shoot with my 5D Mark III. It's, it's a joy. But it, it's, about, it's about the art. It's about seeing that picture in your head before you take it and going, ah, I'm going to capture exactly that. I know exactly what it's going to look like. I know exactly the exposure I'm going to use and everything. And that's what I do all the time. I walk around and all I see is pictures. They pop up in my head. And, I, and I, all I do is try to replicate what I've seen in my head. Mm-hmm. This, that's and, interesting. I think I come at it from the exactly opposite thing. I'm like, <laughs> let, me just, let me just go ahead and fire up this viewfinder here and let's see what that looks. Oh, that looks kind of interesting. What if I like turn it upside down and like kind of like, hang I'm, off the I'm side I'm really here. well oh, known to cool. be with my friends walking down the street and I'm walking and I stop. Just stop, right? And yeah, they go, too. what? And I go take three steps back and I'm like, I just saw something really cool. Hang on a sec. Pull out the camera, frame it properly, adjust all the stuff, take a shot and walk away. Yeah. And they're like, what? What was that? And I show them pictures like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, I saw I saw it. I saw it. I was walking and I saw it. And <laughs> and that's kind of what I do a lot. Sometimes it's on purpose. Yeah, there are times when I go for photo walks and I just, like you said, fire up the viewfinder and just start just looking and like. yeah. see what it looks like oh. and get it. But it's like I often just stop dead in my tracks. And I think the average person is totally not like that. You know, yeah. I think most people just take selfies. Really, I think that's what it is. And I think it's, or it's incumbent on picture us of their to friends. remember that and be like, yeah, because that's why you're, we're seeing, you know, a lot of – that's why we're seeing HTC go another year with the, basically the same camera hardware and, and you know, and, and so far get away with it. Because and, I mean, if you think about it – facing camera. Yeah, and if you think yeah. about it, being able to focus quickly and take many shots in a row, the more, more shots you get, the more chance you get to get the right shot, and right? So 10, 10 frames per second. Absolutely. I, I totally get it, but I think it'd be nice to have both. And um, I'm looking forward to, you know, companies like HTC, but also Apple and and LG seems to be making an effort. And, of course, Nokia has always made an effort with camera phones to really kind of – Sony, yeah, mm -hmm. to push – to push to oh. kind of keep pushing the envelope Sony and try new things. Yeah. Like Sony is really ripe right now with their 20-megapixel sensor to give us a pure view-like experience in, and, in Android. Yeah, the, and the sensor is great. And their sensors have always been great. But finally, they're solving their software I know. problem. Where it that sucks. over-processing is – but it's finally going away. You know, I played with that Z1 Compact, and I'm expecting these really over-processed crappy so, shots. So but it really wasn't. Before we move on from camera, here's what, the one last thing I'm going to tell. 
all your listeners and tell you to try out both of you yep. is if you have the M8 now that has a manual mode, it's one of the few Android phones with a manual mode. So go out there and play with that because here's what I've found. I took a whole bunch of shots, um, action shots of like, uh, I have this one picture of uh, the surf hitting the, the shore right under the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm. And I caught it at one eight thousandths of a second. Whoa. So it's like, it's like, it's like, be- well, it, you'd be surprised. Uh, I had to, I still had lots, I could still overexpose at that, at, at one eight thousand, eight hundred, eight thousand, sorry, of a second. So there was lots of room. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's California sunshine is good that way. Sure, yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is that like having that flexibility to say, I want to shoot that kind of freeze frame of, you know, of, of the, um, of the surf, right? Even at the expense of some higher ISO, mm-hmm. uh, is just awesome. Let me actually post that in the chat so you can have a look at it. And, and it's like, to me, that's what it's all about with my camera phones. It's that, that having that flexibility to experiment. You know, the opposite end of it is for me is, is taking the, the 1020 and actually putting it on a tripod and photographing, you know, I'm a super nerd, so photographing model starships in absolute and, pitch blackness with a oh, four-second yeah, yeah. exposure. And then it's like, wow, this is really cops cool? against the sky. This is amazing. And that's the thing. Like, if you look at the shot now, you'll see, like, the exposure is oh, dead on yeah. because I, I just I adjusted it by hand. And on, because I was I set the ISO and the shutter speed by this hand. This is with the M8? It's the M8. <laughs> I want eight thousandths of a second. That's awesome. So if you look carefully in the sky, you see the noise because the ISO, sure. if you look at the photo details there, ISO is 320. Right, but that's so it starts getting noisy. That spray but is I, also but I caught I caught the effing oh, spray. That's brilliant. Wow. You couldn't do that in auto mode. No way. Just gonna, be a, you'd right. miss the shot. You're making a lot of delightful work for me with all these links, but I'm gonna if with your with your uh, permission, I'll post them in Absolutely. the show notes so that everybody can see what oh. we're talking about. This is gorgeous. Um, Michael, you said that you didn't have any Windows Phone news, but there's um, you could include uh, our opposing thoughts, Adam, and my opposing thoughts on the the Windows Phone's need for pure view for, and 41 megapixels. 41 megapixel, megapixel, megapixel cameras. That is very true. At dueling as editorials said, from Adam Dowd said, and Taylor I, Martin. I, up right I really now. think that Sony right now with their 20 megapixel array on the Z2 and Z1 and Z1S should uh, do a software update where they let you capture five megapixel. Like right now there's an eight, like there's an eight meg, the, what is it? What's that mode they have? The superior auto is eight megapixels, right? Uh, yeah, I, for, I and forget. It, it kind of does, it is, it kinda does, does a little, it does a little bit of that pure view trickery, but they're not using it for zoom. And the whole experience on a, on a Sony shooter is, is so good. That I, I always hated it because you'd get them off the phone or onto the computer, and like I say, you'd look at the thing, and you're like, "Wow!" Not only is this noisy, but the noise is—it makes it look like an oil painting almost. It's so right, bad. Right. But they've finally solved that, and now I think the only thing that, that Sony has to do, as far as I'm concerned, to to make me happy, is to you know push their products in the United States, which they don't. Exactly. Yeah. But anyway. Um, Let's. I think it's time. It, it, Taylor, you make a good point. Forty-one megapixel debate uh, is 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 live right now. Taylor's response to Adam Dowd's piece regarding the relative merit of forty-one megapixel cameras. And uh, Miriam, I will ask you if you would stick around for one piece of listener yeah, mail. Will I can you do certainly that? stick around. Yeah. All right. Let's jump into listener mail. Bong bong. And I, actually, I'm going to move around the. Um, run down a little bit in the mail, and I want to just get this one from Jordan Shook read first, because this is the one that I think it would be really fun to hear your answer on, Miriam, as well. It is the last one in the lineup, and it goes like this. Hello, Pocket Now. I want to first begin by saying that I cannot go a weekday without listening to the Pocket Now daily. I'm a... Hooray. And I've tuned into the podcast for a while now, and I find every one of them has the right balance of humor, information, and discussion. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks for that. You guys have really helped me discover my love of mobile technology. It's great to hear. On that note, a few questions. And Jordan, uh, I'm sorry, we're only going to get to one of them because it's a big question, and I, it's an interesting one. How does someone get started if they want to do what you guys do? I think your jobs sound awesome. Now, Miriam, we have answered this question on the, uh, on the podcast a couple times before. But Mm -hmm. we rarely do it with a guest on the air. And I (laughs) came to realize that I don't think I actually know how you started. And I'm tempted to say it's because you were in the comments a lot. But would you tell us uh, back in 2006 where you how you got your start in this field? Yeah. So, um, you know, I I was um, like my job before being a journalist, being a blogger at Engadget was I was a software engineer in video games for 15 years. So I worked on a lot of games. Um, and uh, 
I, so I've always had a passion for uh, consumer electronics. Like when I was, uh, I'm, I'm kind of old, I'm 45. So I, you know, no when way. I was a kid, yeah. So when I was a kid, you know, like in the late seventies, early eighties, when I was a teenager, you know, I would like drool over these mail order catalogs of, you know, tape decks and CD players and, you ever go to and the like I was, popular science, you know, like I, I was, part. yeah, I was into, I was into all this stuff. Of course I couldn't afford any of it, yeah. but, but the, t- the thing was that I, because I always had a passion for audio, you know, that's kind of always driven my consumer electronics lust and as as the computer revolution you know happened i was lucky enough to start programming as a as a kid like in the late 70s so i got to play with you know like the apple II and the Com- the, Com- the the texas instrument 994a and then later on the commodore 64 and the uh yes. You know, all the, the first computer, the, computer even, even like the the Sinclair Spectrum, because I was in Europe at the time, and 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 then eventually, you know, graduated graduated to the Atari SC and the Amiga, and then the PC, and then the Mac, and and anyway, the the point is that um, I always had a passion for technology, a passion for. Uh, Mobile computing in particular, I was always fascinated by things like the the Scion organizer, things that you could put in your pocket but basically were a computer. Yeah. And this is why, you know, me working at Pebble today makes sense because I love c- computers that are tiny, tiny computers. So um, as I obviously just, you know, got older and started to make a bit more money, I was able to buy some toys. And, Isn't that the uh, best you know, part of growing yeah, up, by it's, the way? It's, like it's sweet, to right? So, so in the early 2000s, the two things that kind of made me get into blogging were the fact that uh, blogs like Gizmodo and Engadget came around, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, this was like, you have to understand, today we take all this stuff for granted because we all kind of do it. But, but blogging, when it was new, you know, somebody had to be the first to redo a technology blog in the style that we know today. And I think, you know, Peter Royas uh, with Gizmodo and then later Engadget was kind of like the first guy to really get it, this kind of casual style, cover, really understanding what matters and distilling it down to readers. And and making it kind of like news centric and, and fast paced and all that was was delightful, in a right? Rather complicated field if you're not careful. Yeah, exactly. And so so to me that was like much better than you know buying a, a Wired magazine and and getting like only have to wait mo- one month to get the next issue and all that other stuff. Okay. So this so I was this is how it all happened. A friend of mine, his name is uh, Asaf, and he is uh, a very well known uh, Ruby developer and. And he blogs about Ruby. And in 2005, 2006, he started blogging about Ruby, like basically sharing some tricks and ideas and programming tips that he had. And and we were uh, sitting at the coffee shop near my house here a couple blocks away in Portrero Hill. And he said we, were, we had this lengthy debate about the motor rocker. Oh, the motor, the Motorola right. music you know, phone. Yeah. And I was, and I was like, I was, I actually, I still have that po- the, my very first podcast because I recorded it on my Sony Ericsson. Seven K seven fifty I. Your podcast. Uh, I recorded, recorded the I recorded the conversation we had, and I made that my first podcast ever. Wow. And uh, and we and debated. It was on the Motorola, the, you're talking about the Rocker E one, the the, the yeah, iTunes the Rocker E one, and basically we did I was a throwback ra- on that a few months I, ago. I was railing on Motorola for making crappy phones. No, it was a really bad phone. It was terrible. God. And so and so he said, you know, you have so much passion and you 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 love this stuff so much and you know it so well. Why don't you start writing about this? Uh, why don't you publish this into a podcast since you recorded it? And why don't you start writing? I'm like, well, I don't know anything about it. He says, well, you know, it's easy. You can go to wordpress.com and make yourself a blog and get started. And I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. He's like, you know, look, uh, the worst comes to worst. You need to do some technical writing for your job from time to time. So this will help you write faster because you'll, you'll write about things you're passionate about. And it'll teach you how to write. And then you'll write faster for your work. And I was like, okay, okay great. So I, I started a blog on WordPress. And I started podcasting, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I, I knew the tech, right? Like, because sure. I know my stuff. Know the material, and so yeah. people took me seriously very quickly. And then what also happened is at the same time, the netbook came out. And I've oh, wow. been hack- I've been building in, like, that was a little later, I guess, 2007 Seven or 8. Or eight. Was netbook. Yeah. yeah, so my blog was first, like, I would regurgitate news for a while, and I would do unboxing of phones. Like, most of the phones that I bought, you know what I would do? I would go to AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon stores and buy the phones and return them within 30 days because California <laughs> had a 30-day 30 return day, policy yeah, back then. So I'd, I always sometimes thought that that's I, what I would do if I hadn't come across Sometimes I would lose on the restocking myself. fee. Yeah. Sometimes I would lose on the restocking sure, fee, but most but of the time, 
time you're still you're I would in the device. Right. Oh. So that's how I got the st- toys. And then of course people started noticing the unboxing and, and I would always test the cameras and post my pictures. I bought a Flickr account just to post my pictures. Mm-hmm. And basically some people started liking my phone reviews and camera phone evaluations. And at the same time, um, the netbooks came out and I have been, you know, I've, I've, my background is electrical engineering. So I know how to hold a soldering iron and play with stuff. And when I saw these, you know, and because I've always been passionate about small, affordable computers, when the netbooks came out, I bought the the EPC 701 and I I hacked the crap out of that thing. I added a touchscreen to it. By the way. I don't know. You added a um, touchscreen to that thing? I added a touchscreen, I added Bluetooth, I added a whole bunch of stuff to it <laughs> and, and blogged about it, like the progress. I took pictures of my of my soldering and stuff and, oh, yeah. and put it in videos and people love this stuff. And sure. that actually got me on the map because Engadget, Gizmodo and Hackerday picked up my blog. Oh, and nice. that's and so because I live in San Francisco and I was in video games, I would get invited to GDC and other conferences and I got to know the bloggers. So I got to know like uh, people like um, you know, Chris Ziegler and, and others, sure. you know, uh, and and so I started my blog basically got really popular and and I kept, started getting job offers from the big blogs. But I I'm a Canadian citizen and a European citizen, I have dual citizenship and two passports, but I don't have a U.S. citizenship. So the, in, I was working and living in the U.S. Uh, on a visa. And I couldn't work freelance like you, the average person can. Yeah. So, so it wasn't until I got a green card by, you know, when I, after my spouse and I were married for a few years that um, I got uh, finally able to freelance. And at that point, Engadget offered me a part-time gig. So I worked for them part-time. I and then, you know, there that. was the, the, the big exodus to The Verge. Right. And I was actually going to go to, I was so. actually hoping to go to The Verge, but then I saw this opportunity in Gadget, like this vacuum that got created, where they really did need, did need somebody that knew what they were doing with phones, mm-hmm. and they asked me if they, if, you know, and, and basically they asked me if I could join, and, and I did, and, and I was senior mobile editor at Gadget for a number of years, and and from that, I ended up in product, you know, I, I completely got um, this uh, irresistible offer from from Eric, my boss at Pebble, to join the company. Eric, who uh, who Taylor met at CES. There you go. As I recall, from that's from correct. During an interview, and uh, who I was supposed to meet, and I was instead uh, uh, driving from you know Wyoming or wherever the hell I was. Uh, but <laughs> Wyoming. So, wow. you no, know, I got you know it was that horrible plane problem with all the. Oh all the right, all yeah, yeah, I remember that. that. So, it's horrible, but uh, that's still one of my favorite parts of this year so far. <laughs> and what, and uh, working in this job, no meeting Eric, it was really oh, cool. Okay, I thought you meant me being stuck. Uh, uh, that too. <laughs> Thank you. That too. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I enjoyed watching that from afar. Um, but J- so Jordan, um, so do that and you will be set. <laughs> yeah. So basically my <laughs> advice to you is this, is just get, you know, just get started. It's, yeah. it's free to get a blog, a blog today. Flickr offers you one gig now, watch like for free to host pictures and G plus is a great platform for but hosting pictures. As you say though, it's a harder world to break into now because it's much, much, much harder. bigger. But you know what? The thing is, you need to find a niche, right? Like for me, it was phone photography and hacking netbooks. And of course, the netbooks eventually died and I stopped hacking. And also because of my job at Engadget, I stopped blogging basically on my own blog for three years. Right. Um, that it kind of killed it. Like I don't have the readership I have because I stopped publishing. So people were lost interest. But the point is that if you, and right now I'm just doing it for fun and I'm not really putting a lot of energy into it. Right. But I think find a niche. Uh, and I think video is the way to go. YouTube is free go nuts you know we have incredible tools accessible to us you can use a phone like the 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 lumia icon or the 1520 which have phenomenal video performance with ois and use those them use those use those as a main main video recorder we actually did Uh, that a couple times when we our camera was busted or something like that brandon and i were at an at t event we're like just break out the lumia and the iphone and and you can zoom really nicely with those live while you're recording and they have really good sound audio too so my point is i mean i honestly think that blogging is a dead is dead I, I mean in the traditional sense the way i was doing it i think the future is microblogging in the sense of like snippets of info uh using primarily social media and and i think video is the way to go and you can do all that from a phone ideally if you really want to be kind of like breaking be more flexible and faster at responding to things and really being there being able to do everything on your phone is the way to go oh that's key so and so i think 
that that doesn't make it very good for writing long pieces. If you're into writing long pieces, I say absolutely do it on your PC and and create a blog. But the problem with long pieces, people don't read them. You know, anything more than a thousand words is going to be hard for people to read. It depends. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think I think Verge and and uh, sites like certainly the information and stuff have done well with long forms. Yeah, stuff, but but they know. are well established. They have an established audience. Out, sure. If you're you just know, starting I, out, then yeah. Uh, if you're David Polk, of course you can sit down and write a ten thousand word piece and people will read it. <laughs> but <laughs> but I think for us, you know, um, differentiation through niche. Um, be, and here, here's the thing: pick something you're passionate about. Because for me, what I got unanimously feedback from my readers, you know, and I wasn't even monetizing; I wasn't even trying to limit because I was working as a software engineer at the same time. I had a source of income, yeah, you so were I was doing it because you loved it. One. And exactly, but doing it because I loved it meant that I didn't have any sponsors or advertisers to worry about. Yeah. And I didn't have to worry about it being my source of income. So that meant that I could be as brash as I needed to be, as honest as I needed to be. And people liked that. And people also liked the fact that I was really passionate about what I do. Absolutely. And and if you are, because if the topic is something you love, you're going to do it. And when I think somebody said something very similar the last time we brought this up on the show, and I don't remember exactly who the quote is from, but uh, yes, not only do what you love, but have something to say. Right. I think there's there, there it can be very tempting to just kind of come out and and bat around a bunch of points and not really, um, not really say anything with with a whole lot of words, which is a difficult trap. So, yeah, be mindful of that. But God, I I have found the greatest success and the greatest satisfaction in my life uh, doing things that I really want to do and sort of when I'm able, letting the 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 money and the business aspect of it come later. So. I think that's good right. advice, Miriam. And, and podcasting is a great way to have an opinion. God, about podcasting is so much Because fun. you know what? I it's, love podcasting. I, <laughs> I have a hard time writing long pieces. I'll be honest with you. I'm not a fast writer, which is very difficult when you're in this biz. Neither am I. Um, and I, I'm much better articulating my thoughts in a verbal format with an, a person that I can kind of fling the idea at and they can fling it back saying it's shit. Oh, it's good, you know. This is and, why and, podcasts are so are continue to be underrated because it's a, it's an entirely different medium. People are like, sometimes you get the occasional feedback where it's like, you guys should be more professional. It's like this is this is that is not the f- reason for this show. Exactly, yeah. exactly. This is this. But to me, you know, this down. is what I would do. Like, look at find something niche that you love that you're passionate about. If you can avoid having any restrictions of what you have to say because of advertisers and sponsors, do that. I understand that some of you are trying to make living off of blogging so it's you know find what works for you there but i would say podcasting and video have to be a huge part of that unless you're an amazingly accomplished writer and you can you know weave together these amazing stories but it's going to much be much harder to capture a really strong audience with long pieces at first in my opinion yeah and i think uh taylor i i would i would ask for your views on that but uh i'm going to direct folks to our get to know you pieces for, yeah. for that. Speaking of long form, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I got carried away with that. Mom was like 3,500 words. <laughs> yeah. I'm really we, good with long form pieces. Like, that's my thing. <laughs> we ran for about six weeks, Miriam, every week we ran like a sort of editor profile just because people were Ooh. asking so much about us. And so, we're, yeah, those are still, I think they're like about a year old. So they're still fairly fresh. We'll, uh, fire them in. I think, uh, though, we are coming up on the two-hour mark, so I'm going to save some of this other listener mail for uh, for next time. If it's all the same to you folks, and we can all sort of get back to our lives. Does that sound good? Yeah. yeah i got a lot of stuff to do. I'm amazed it's been two hours. It feels like we've only been talking for 15 minutes. I know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I, I'm, but I knew it would go this way, and I'm, I'm really, really glad that we finally made it happen. I think I first uh, proposed it back in, in London or something, Miriam, so I'm really th- – thankful that we were able to make it happen and thank you so much for carving the time out of your day no i really appreciate it it's always fun you know i love i love make, doing podcasts and uh, any chance i get i will do them so thanks for having me i'm really pleased and and taylor uh thank you uh, as always for your your co-piloting duties and whatever uh, <laughs> <laughs> miriam let's uh, <laughs> let's do this again at some point i uh i think it would be would be fun to touch base again and o- over the airwaves and absolutely if, maybe i would love that yeah, we, and go ahead. do you want to be on my podcast sometime 
I would love that. Yes, absolutely. We'll do it. Awesome. Well, since I'm we're doing of... this, why don't you be on my podcast? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? I am. I am uh, doing it about once a month, and uh, I have kind of the first few months. I've actually got a bunch of people lined up. I'm trying to kind of get some of my old cohorts uh, and regulars that from the Engadget you podcast. You got Vlad on. on your last one, right? Yeah. So, like, I'm trying to get. Like, I got first. I got Brad, then I got Chris Ziegler. I've got Vlad in the last one. I'm going to try to get Richard Lai and nice. Sean Cooper. And then once I've got these guys behind, I think they're kind of like the core group that I used to podcast with, I'm going to start lining up, you know, other media folks like you guys and others. And, you know, I'm actually also trying to get some really interesting people like John Letcher. Oh, and be great. Like, I was uh, I meant to ask you about that before. You guys are like made for each other in an interviewer, we're, interviewee we're, kind we're, of we're, way. We're right? kind of Twitter pals, but yeah. Uh, huh. yeah. Uh, I you know I just I, I just uh, on a podcast I, he, I believe he's just gotten his hands on a pebble steel, so it'll be interesting to see how he feels about it. But uh, uh, sure yeah, I'm I'm trying to get like I would love to get somebody like Stephen Elop on. So I'm I'm working on these kind of kind of big names. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'm not a big. I mean, I'm a name, but I'm not as big of a name as they are. So it's kind of more of a convincing the people I have relationships with in the media and public relations world to believe in me enough to let me do this stuff because then you know my my readership aka my 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 audience isn't that gigantic um and so it it's hard for them to commit to these things but at the same time i think you know these conversations would be pretty awesome so i have see how it goes every faith that that is correct now tell people where they can uh, find those podcasts the in the old so ones. Uh, my blog will be where you can uh, see them and listen to them uh tank t- Tankerl.com, tnkgrl.com. Uh, I'm Tankerl on uh, Twitter at tnkgrl. Uh, look for me on Google Plus. The, 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 I have three Google Plus accounts. If you're good digging around, the one I really only use is a uh, tnkgrl at Gmail. Uh, and um, what I would say is, uh, if you want to subscribe to the podcast, there's a link in my blog uh, on each podcast post that lets you subscribe via, you know, iTunes or any podcatcher you have. I have both MP3 and uh, and uh, um, what is it, M4A M4 or whatever a and, yeah formats. It's all done you automatically you through feed burner. Raw, raw file like waves. No, and stuff, no, you, know, you know, because it's really. Gigabyte. I mean, the sound quality is good enough to come up. It's VBR MP3, so it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I have. Uh, uh, also, I have a YouTube now. channel that you can subscribe to if the YouTube the videos are posted on my blog. So what I do for my podcast is actually live and it's video live. So it's kind of cool. Yes. Uh, and then the audio is published about a few days after the live version. Audio, audio only published on uh, on uh, you, iTunes, etc. But of course, the video lives on, right? Because uh, Hangouts Live lets you of record course. a YouTube video. So that's how I do it. We've got a this couple is, Hangouts based series, but I've just the weekly has always been old school and I'm like, no, it's going to be audio only. I don't want to worry about how I look. We're just going to talk, and it's going to. Be- no, that's for sure. I mean, it's different. But for me, I've you know, having done mostly audio only for so many years, I'm kind oh, of video is a treat for you, and, then. yeah, and really trying something new with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I know. It's fun so, to get readers in the same room when you're doing video too. It's like, hey, what's what's your name? Where are you from? Let's talk. So yeah, subscribe to my YouTube. Uh, you know, subscribe to the the podcast. Read my blog. My blog is basically a good place to go if you everything that I publish ends up on my blog somehow. So if you want one central location where you'll get everything, that's the place to go. The only other one is obviously Twitter because I talk a lot on Twitter. And then there's Facebook. It's a bit harder to find me on Facebook because it gets mostly friends and family. But I will add you if I know you or have heard of you. So, so that's the challenge. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's six no, years. I'm the same way. We I all know one another, right? Yeah, you know how it exactly. goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, uh, thank you, everyone, for for, uh, for sticking around. We appreciate it. Shoot us some email if you uh, if you have it. That is going to do it for now on this episode of the Pocket Now Weekly. Miriam, once again, thank you for joining us. And Michael, a pleasure. Thank you. Listeners, thank you for your listener mail every week. We love it. Even if it doesn't make it to the airwaves like some of the uh, mail from this particular cast, we do read every piece sent to us at podcast at pocketnow.com. Also, be sure to find us on Twitter. Miriam, once again, is at Tank Girl, TNKGRL. Taylor's at Casper Tech. And I am at Captain Two Phones, as always. You can follow Pocket Now officially at Pocket Now Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Google+. And if you enjoy the podcast, we hope you do, please leave us a review on iTunes, Xbox Music, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts are heard. As always, we thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with more Mobile Tech Talk next week. Toasty! Toasty!